Valencia. And I am the chairman of the uh, Spanish Society for Transplantation. And then uh, I welcome you to Valencia. I don't know if you have attended to the EBMT meeting uh, recently, but anyway, I, I welcome you to Valencia and to this symposium that you know is entitled uh, Allogeneic Stem Cell Transplantation in HIV Infection Subjects. And then, the, as you know, uh, the potential of cure of patients uh, with HIV uh, infected with the, the use of CCR5, Delta 32 uh, uh, stem cell transplantation, open new windows of, of investigation that today we will review. And uh, well, uh, you know that uh, uh, previously you have reviewed some of the, of the projects that the Epistemis Consortium is, is supporting and then we will review here and discuss the, the, the most important parts of the, of the, of the projects. Then, uh, the session will be chaired by Do uh, Dr. José Luis Díez, uh, Javier Martínez Picado, that you will know, and then we will start. Okay? Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, yes, uh, I want to say that welcome, everyone. Uh, we have um, six presentations that they will last about 20 minutes each, and then we'll have a discussion panel. I think that after each presentation, if you had... Um, if you had like a short question that is not very debatable, we can do it and we can have that question. Otherwise, we would prefer to keep the questions by the end for the debate. Um, thank you. I know that in the room there are from hematologists, ID fellows, uh, there are people from gene therapy field. So I think there is a lot of diversity, pediatricians as well. So there are a lot of diversity in the in the room, and I guess that will have the opportunity to learn from each other in this, in this symposium, which is, by the way, the first one that Epistem organizes openly. So thank you again for coming. And with a further delay, we'll start with uh, the first talk. Uh, Mick Wong from uh, Hospital Gregorio Marañón will address a presentation of allotransplant in HIV-positive patients. Thank you, Mick. Javier, Javier, I need your help. Yes. <laughs> Se me movió y hay que poner la primera. Eh, ¿Así? Y voy pasando con esta, ¿no? Sí. Pasando con esta. Sí, 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 sí. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. And I would like to thank the organizers, to Javier, especially, and Anne-Marie, to uh, for putting together this exciting meeting and in, for inviting us to to share our experience. So I will try to summarize briefly uh, the experience in allogeneic stem cell transplantation in patients with HIV infection. As you well know, the um, introduction of antiretroviral therapy has uh, had an enormous impact on survival of uh, patients with HIV infections since the late 90s. But still, uh, um, uh, malignant diseases, especially hematological malignant diseases, are uh, the leading cause of uh, death in this population. Uh, in, during the antiretroviral therapy era, the outcome of autologous stem cell transplantation in patients with HIV and lymphoma approached that uh, seen in HIV and infected patients, and this uh, therapy with high dose chemotherapy and, and stem cell transplantation has become a standard of care also in patients with HIV infection. This is our own experience in the, from our center. Uh, we have been performing autologous stem cell transplantation in these patients with lymphoma uh, since 1999. And I, this is the update of our data in 27 patients. And as you can see, uh, various and different types of uh, lymphoma, high-grade uh, lymphomas. And uh, the uh, results in survival are similar of those expected in, an, an, uh, in HIV uninfected patients with lymphoma. 
Although less explored, allogeneic stem cell transplantation has also been reported as feasible in patients with hematological malignancies and HIV infection. Uh, the, uh, this procedure consists <laughs> of the administration of chemotherapy with or without radiotherapy in the recipient mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, to obtain three objectives, main objectives. Mm -hmm. One, to immunosuppress the recipient to pre prevent graft uh, re uh, rejection, mm -hmm. to reduce number of tumor cells and to re reduce the number of recipient hemopoietic cells. This is followed by the infusion of um, um, uh, stem cells from a healthy donor and nowadays fortunately we have various options uh, to, to, to do this from HLA match siblings which is the gold standard in the majority of the cases unrelated donors, umbilical cord blood stem cells and also haploidentical donors more recently. And the idea and the objective finally is to replace all the hematological cells from the recipient uh, with these uh, healthy uh, stem cells from the donor and finally achieve a full donor chimera. So in the pre-antiretroviral therapy era, allogeneic stem cell transplantation was not successful in the setting of HIV infection, mainly due to the high non-relapse mortality associated um, uh, with infection in, in the majority of the cases. On the left-hand side, you can see the uh, report from the CBMTR from 1987 and 2003, and you can see uh, the overall survival that we achieved in this uh, registry registry study and on the left hand side uh, right hand side you can see the uh, a graphic from uh, a, a very extensive review done uh, by Dr. Giro Hotter uh, there is our next speaker, where you can see that uh, the introduction also the, of uh, antiretroviral therapy in the setting of allogeneic stem cell transplantation improved survival in, in these patients. In our own experience from uh, Madrid, from our center, um, we could uh, see that this procedure is uh, feasible as well in these patients, but also we could document the uh, antitumor anti-tumor effect that we uh, look after allogeneic trans stem cell transplantation in patients with malignancies. Uh, in this particular case, this was a, a male with a lymphoma, high-grade lymphoma, who relapsed after allogeneic stem cell transplantation and could achieve uh, another a new uh, complete remission status uh, after receiving rituximab and donor lymphocyte uh, infusions, uh, which are often used uh, to, to treat uh, relapse after allogeneic stem cell transplantation. Since the publication of the Berlin patient by Dr. Hutter, uh, who was a patient with a a AML, who was transplanted with a donor who uh, was a CCR5 Delta 32 homozygous, which confers resistance to the HIV infection. Um, uh, this is the first case that has been documented with a functional cure of HIV. Uh, he is now eight years with uh, free of antiretroviral therapy and uh, the patient is doing very well. So since this publication, um, a number of questions have raised about the mechanisms uh, that could be involved for the functional cure in this patient. Among them, the relative um, involvement of the high dose uh, conditioning chemotherapy that this patient received, the total, total body irradiation, the use of antithymocyte globulin, uh, also the engraftment, of course, of donor cells resistance to the uh, HIV infection, uh, the pharmacologic immune uh, suppression and modulation that the patient received after transplantation, and of course, the achievement of full donor chimerism and the possible graft versus host disease and graft versus reservoir disease uh, the effect that could this uh, be involved in this in this uh, outcome on the other hand we have the experience of the Boston patients these are two patients diagnosed with lymphoma who were transplanted with uh, donors uh, who were CCR5 wild type in these cases uh, these two patients received transplants uh, with reduced intensity conditioning regimen so they didn't receive TBI and no ATG 
uh, antiretroviral therapy uh, were continued throughout all the pre and post transplant period in, the, in both cases and uh, both cases presented clinical significant uh, graft versus host disease uh, which needed immunosuppressive therapy. And what they found uh, in the follow-up after transplantation is an, a substantial reduction of uh, proviral DNA, HIV DNA, in PBMCs and rectal mucosa in one of the patients that could study it after uh, achieving full donor chimerism and the recovery of CD4 uh, positive T cell counts. Uh, so uh, after four, more than four years in one of the patients and two and a half years in, in the other patient and still with no detectable DNA in the samples, they decided to interrupt the antiretroviral therapy in both patients and uh, after 12 weeks in one of the patients and 32 weeks in the other patient. Uh, in, in this period, these patients free of antiretroviral therapy remain aviremic, but um, after these periods in both patients, uh, viremia rebound and also accompanied with uh, symptoms that mimicked the, those uh, associated with uh, primary HIV infection. And symptoms and, and viremia um, were resolved after restarting um, antiretroviral therapy in both cases. So while these results, final results are um, disappointing somehow, uh, important insights <coughs> into the HIV persistence and challenges of viral relocation uh, can be concluded from these uh, results. First, the substantial reduction in the viral reservoir resulting from allogeneic stem cell transplantation in these cases allowed a variable period of uh, uh, antiretroviral therapy free remission uh, of HIV disease. The viral rebound most likely occurred from long-lived tissue reservoirs that persist at levers or in compartments undetectable by current assays. Absence of, and of detectable cellular immune responses and uh, declining antibody titers during the period that the, this patient didn't have receiving the, uh, were not receiving antiretroviral therapy suggests that virus specific immunity did not play a significant role in limiting replication of these la latent providers. So uh, we hypothesize, and, and the, the authors also, that graft versus reservoir effect mm -hmm. might, may play a role in maintaining these patients in those periods free of uh, viremia. And finally, the rapid virological rebound and develop, development of symptoms and also the emergence of the new antiretroviral therapy mutation in one of these cases uh, should alert us of that uh, future studies of antiretroviral therapy interruption should proceed with caution in the setting of allogeneous stem cell transplantation. And what is our experience in uh, Hospital Gregorio Marañón in Madrid? We've been performing allogeneic stem cell transplantation in HIV patients since 1999. So far, we transplanted in our center nine adult patients uh, uh, between 33 and 57 years old, one female and eight males. All patients had high risk hematological diseases and conditioning regimen. Uh, three patients received myeloablative conditioning regimen, and six, the majority of them, uh, reduced intensity conditioning regimen. Uh, and Chile's uh, identical silving was used in five cases, and the rest, uh, four, almost uh, half of the patients, received an alternative donor one, uh, an unrelated core blood, and the other three, happily identical donors. And all patients received continuous antiretroviral therapy, except in three cases that had they had to stop in, in, in the post-transplant period due to uh, bowel and mucositis. Uh, so in detail you can see the patients here, uh, all the diagnoses that you can see, uh, acute le leukemia in one case and uh, mostly uh, um, lymphomas, but you can see also uh, primary myelofibrosis in one of the cases, very, very high risk uh, diseases and uh, the uh, year they were transplanted and the condition in regimen you can see there and uh, reminding you that most of the patients re uh, receive a reduced intensity condition in regimen and the donor source that we use in each case and graft versus host, uh, uh, versus host disease prophylaxis. Uh, I would like to um, detail the patient that we uh, transplanted with the Aplocore 
transplantation. This was a, a patient with a Burkitt lymphoma who has, uh, had relapsed, and this patient received this uh, procedure, which uh, was a pioneer in uh, Madrid, in Puerto Hierro Hospital, uh, uh, called haplocore or dual transplantation. And this procedure consists of the uh, infusion of uh, one sing or, uh, a single uh, core blood unit together with uh, 34 positive cells from a third party HLA mismatch donor in order to obtain an initial neutrophil engraftment derived from the third party donor until uh, they are replaced by the core blood cells uh, w uh, which engraft permanently. And this is the, the platform you, we use uh, in general when we use uh, core blood. And uh, three patients of our series receive haploidentical transplantation and the protocol we follow is uh, some, well, a little bit modified from the Baltimore um, group protocol which use unmanipulated uh, haploidentical cells. We use in all cases peripheral blood and uh, the prophylaxis of graft versus host disease was performed with uh, high dose cyclos uh, cyclos Phosphomide, post transplant, high dose of cyclophosphamide on days three and four together with MMF and cyclosporin. So, uh, in all these cases, except two, the first patient was a, a, a lymphoma patient with very, very uh, bad status and, and visible face when we transplanted, and this patient uh, died early on after transplantation because of an uh, infectious complication. And the last patient with primary myelofibrosis, very advanced disease also, this patient presented a graft failure, which is a complication that is uh, relatively frequent in this um, setting. Uh, except these two patients, all the other patients uh, showed adequate neutrophil engraftment. And here I summarize uh, the complications that these patients uh, presented and I would like to highlight that these patients in general, no, they don't have, um, in our experience, uh, much toxicity uh, regarding mucositis or hepatic toxicities or renal toxicities. Uh, mostly, I, we think, is because in this series, majority of the patients receive a reduced intensity conditioning regimen. Uh, but what we see is a, a very frequent infectious complications in early on after transplantation. Mostly, uh, you can see here, mostly viral infections, but also uh, bacterial infections and fungal infection in some of the cases, but a uh, virus is, is very, very frequent. Uh, we had encephalitis, uh, encephalitis and also, uh, for example, a patient with a, a Kaposi sarcoma uh, uh, after transplantation. So this is something that we have to take into account in, this, in these cases. And also, uh, uh, um, three out of five patients presented uh, significant acute graft versus host disease that needed treatment, and, uh, and three out of six, uh, out of five cases, also presented extensive chronic graft versus host disease, uh, which uh, also needed therapy, immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, I would like to show you this one. We, we, you can see graphically uh, all our cases, and in gray are the patients uh, who died, and in blue the patients who are still alive and, and doing very well. And uh, as you can see, after a significant long period of follow-up. Um, uh, unfortunately, two patients, uh, although they were in remission, uh, they presented in the context of graft versus host disease, chronic graft versus host disease, and infectious, uh, serious infectious complications has died due to that. And in the case of the blue patients, they, they are, all the three cases are in remission, in complete chimerism, free of immunosuppressive therapy, and ongoing with continuous antiretroviral uh, therapy. So uh, to must summarize uh, what we have learned from uh, this experience is that allostem cell transplantation is, a, is feasible in HIV mm -hmm. patients. Uh, we can achieve adequate engraftment and long-term control of the hematological disease, uh, including, uh, this is feasible including the use of alternative donors. And these patients can be transplanted when they don't have a much uh, related donor with uh, alternative donors. No significant interaction associated with antiretroviral therapy we've seen. We, we didn't see much interactions and always avoiding protein inhibitors. Uh, and we didn't see increased uh, toxicity, but uh, again, uh, these patients received most of the RIC uh, regimens. Uh, but 
we should say that these patients are, are complicated, uh, it's a complex, complex procedure, they have frequent infectious complications and sometimes the, these are very difficult to manage in the uh, early on after transplantation and, and often as you saw uh, are severe especially in the presence of, of graft versus host disease. And these results uh, somehow are being confirmed with larger studies. This is a comparative study presented last year in the EBMT meeting uh, by Dr. Duarte, uh, comparing uh, 100 at 11 patients with HIV and hematological malignancies who underwent allogenase transplantation between 1997 and 2014, uh, compared with match controls with uh, HIV uninfected patients. And uh, what I would like to highlight is that um, the patients with HIV uh, who were transplanted had a higher uh, rate of graft versus host disease, acute at least, and uh, mortality rate, toxic mortality rate was higher compared to the controls, so uh, overall survival at the end also was uh, worse. So it, it seems like uh, these, these transplants are uh, more toxic in this subgroup of, of patients. So with this I would like to conclude, uh, allogeneic stem cell transplantation should be offered to patients with HIV infection with high risk hematological <coughs> disease. The choice of donor, graft source and conditioning regimen should be based on the underlying disease, the availability and the urgency of the transplant in every case, as we always do with HIV negative patients. Uh, but we should take into account the possibility of a CCR5 uh, negative or homozygous uh, source. Um, and we have to take into account this possibility when we are searching for a donor in, in a candidate. These are complex procedures with higher non-relapse mortality rate, mainly due to infectious complications in our experience, and especially in the context of graft versus host disease, so these patients need a close monitoring. Mm -hmm. And efforts should be made to continue antiretroviral therapy throughout the conditioning and post-transplantation period in very close collaboration with the infectious disease team. I would like to thank all the um, members of our units in our center who are involved in the care of these patients and thank you for your attention. If you have any short question for me before we move into the next speaker, that would be wonderful. Short questions, short, short answers. Compare your vision about another kind of patient with another kind of transplant, the infection has increased in the patient's It's difficult to say, yeah, but it's difficult, we, we didn't compare it yet formally, okay. but my impression is that these patients usually have more infections. Okay. Uh, even the last one of the last patients, for instance, had an uh, herpetic reactivation, yes. even receiving prophylaxis. So these patients have somehow, of course, these were very heavily treated patients, but are some complications that we usually don't see in other patients with the same um, transplant or uh, diagnosis. Okay. Uh, the sarcoma, for instance, is very unusual. And also uh, we had a CMB pneumonia, which is not so com uh, uh, common nowadays. So my impression is that they have more uh, infectious complications. Uh, congratulations for the presentation and for the longer uh, line of work. But uh, you said that uh, the toxicity is not increased in this in this group of patients, but the the the, the higher infection rates. Yes, of course. Is a, is a, it's a toxicity. A yes. When I say toxicity, I will. I was um, going more of the mucositis and the okay. organ toxicity that we usually see in the, in this uh, setting. But uh, no, no, infections, of course, uh, counts of as of course co counts as a toxicity in, in these cases. In the cause of death, you know, most of the cases. Yes, it was non-relapse mortality. Or, exactly. Or, uh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Me. Thanks. We can put the mic here. Yeah. Oh, very good. Good, good. <laughs> so, if there is a reason to be here today, or maybe a, a guilty person for being here today, having this workshop, <laughs> it's Gary. <girl. laughs> so, to be guilty about that, I think that 
that he will give us a very nice um, presentation, and he is the person with probably the greatest experience in this in this field. So we are really honored at Epistem that he is part of the consortium, and I will leave you with uh, his speech. Yeah, thank you. you want to make me so thank you for the nice words <laughs> and yeah it's uh, it's about uh, the Berlin patient and um, um, I will cover uh, just four points uh, I will give a brief uh, look back on the development and uh, what makes this uh, CCR5 that the 32 graft is probably special in terms of transmutation and how we find so, uh, this, these uh, donors with this mutation and give a brief outlook. So um, first, um, yeah, we have uh, this year the 10 years anniversary of the uh, start of the donor search for CCR5 deleted persons and next year uh, Timothy Brown is uh, 10 years uh, free from virus of the antiviral therapy. And this is uh, in, the, in the lobby of the Fred Hutch in Seattle. And funnily, uh, Timothy Brown is born in Seattle. And Thomas, uh, Donald Thomas uh, was uh, the pioneer in uh, bone marrow transplantation. So the circuit had closed <laughs> in this picture. But in the beginning, uh, it was just a small group in my old hospital at the Charity Berlin. This is my my work team workers and in the lab had and we were in terms of HIV completely amateurs. We had, had no idea what we uh, really did there, but we were successful. And we started uh, later on, uh, we tried to repeat uh, this approach in other patients and we invited here people from, from other registries, uh, from the national registry here of uh, the, um, and try to promote the idea and to find uh, more patients. But it was um, not very successful because most of them didn't believe that uh, it's possible that uh, we can screen uh, donors for a larger number and everyone was very skeptical. So uh, I did it on my own uh, <laughs> in my lab in my time in Mannheim and I was quite successful in, in identifying uh, donor searches. This is all donor searches which I did in, in, uh, in Mannheim, but not everything, uh, every uh, transplantation uh, was performed. But the somewhere performed one was uh, done in, also in Germany in Bielefeld with a, with a donor with the CCR5 uh, homozygous delta 32 deletion, but unfortunately the patient died a couple of weeks after transplantation. So um, I would stand alone here. Uh, uh, Till now, if I didn't uh, find, uh, met a special woman, it's Monique. <laughs> we met in, at, at a conference in St. Martin, and after this, uh, this, uh, uh, this group was bigger, bigger, becomes bigger and bigger, and now uh, I'm proud that I'm part of the, the Epistem uh, group here uh, in the, at the meeting in Barcelona. And now we have uh, um, gathered a lot of, of data uh, of patients and, uh, and uh, I think that's, that's, that is a real a good thing and uh, a good uh, promotion of the idea. So um, is there something special with uh, the CCF Delta 32 deletion in the graft? And uh, this is an example uh, quite old from, uh, uh, from organ transplantation, from tissue transplantation. So if you are uh, CCR5 data 32 homozygous as a recipient, you have a very good uh, probability that your kidney transplant will survive. So there's something special with the uh, CCR5 data 32 deletion in terms of immunological responses. And uh, this is important in terms of allergenic transplantation. And uh, this was the first work uh, from the Polish uh, group uh, who uh, looked for possible association uh, of uh, the CCR5, Delta 32 uh, genotype and uh, other factors uh, and uh, in the occurrence of graft versus host disease. And they found a weak association, but uh, they only investigated uh, 186 cases. And a larger trial was done uh, again in the Fred Hutch 
uh, with uh, retrospectively uh, analyzed 2000, uh, 1,273 um, transplantations, and nine of them were homozygous, uh, uh, received a homozygous transplant for not HIV patient, and they found no association. But uh, the, the uh, number of investigated uh, uh, candidates is probably uh, still too, too low. And you know, have seen this um, uh, survival curve. I've updated this with the newer data from after 2010. And yeah, we, we stay still at 50% mortality after uh, a little more of two years. And you already see in the EBMT data where they um, uh, looked for um, uh, the uh, survival of HIV positive recipients of allergenic transplantation, and they are a little bit uh, worse than the HIV negative population. So, but principally, um, it's, it's feasible to make this. And then uh, this case was published in uh, 2014, uh, was a patient who received exactly the same treatment like the Berlin patient, uh, received here the allergenic transplant with the CCR5-32 homozygous graft, but he rebounded with the virus and um, later uh, uh, had a relapse of this disease and died after that, after one year of, of treatment. But there were uh, uh, recent um, um, uh, differences between the Berlin patient and the Essen patient. The, the virus uh, was much more mutated and uh, they stopped the antiviral therapy seven days before transplantation. So the virus had probably enough time to rebound and to escape from the immune system. And um, yeah, this is, and the, the uh, 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 complete chimerism was uh, reached in the Berlin patient after 11 days after the transplantation and in the Essen patient 39 days. So it was a very long time for a virus, competent uh, virus to replicate and to uh, escape from the CCR5 uh, cells. So this could be an explanation. And uh, the, probably the next Berlin patient comes from Düsseldorf. This is uh, uh, presented this year at CORE, also at the EBMT. Uh, the patient uh, received, uh, like the Berlin patient twice, uh, allergenic transplantation, both with a CCR5-32 homozygous graft, but he's still two years after the transplantation, still on heart, so we have no uh, alternative test uh, if uh, this uh, approach is uh, successful too in terms of HIV. In terms of his uh, malignancy, he's, he survived for over two years, so I think he's uh, is in good remission. But uh, the discussion is now how, when to stop the antiviral therapy. So um, conclusions are principally allergenic transplantation is feasible for HIV patient. And uh, the CCR5 negative grafts have no special impact on uh, the outcome of the transplant. Immunological effects of CCR5 uh, are much uh, unknown. And uh, to my knowledge, eight patients already received a CCR5 delta uh, negative graft, uh, but five died uh, relatively uh, short after the transplantation. And uh, the Essen patient is, is ongoing. And uh, what about the availability? Uh, always uh, the, uh, before when we start this, uh, whole thing and uh, years after that all the people say that's not possible. It's like a, 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 a search in a haystack. And um, what's, this is a, a curve which shows the availability or, or the, the possibility to find a matching donor uh, uh, um, in uh, relation to the matched uh, what are registered donors here on this x-axis. So if you're taking into account that uh, the DKMS is, uh, uh, had already tested uh, over one million and they're going to up to two to two five million uh, donors who are pre-screened for CCR5 and you have a frequency of a little bit more of one percent of uh, CCR5 uh, Delta 32 homozygous in Germany, you have in this registry, 35,000 homozygous 
um, uh, donors. And when you're looking at the, uh, this uh, 35,000, you have a probability of 20% of finding an HLA match and homozygous, CCR5 homozygous donor in Germany. And the problem is that uh, this is uh, how we um, manage the uh, donor search. You have the, the, the patient and the donor center, and usually they don't talk with, another, with uh, together. Uh, there's uh, this uh, national uh, um, coordination center between, and the DKMS made something what uh, uh, causes a lot of discussion they um, make a bypass. So the donor, the search center uh, with the, the patient can directly contact the donor center with the DKMS donor navigator. It looks like this, just uh, uh, an online platform where you can, you can put in your data, uh, especially here the, the HLI tape, and then you get a list of the, pay, of the donors registered at the DKMS, and then you can here click Oh, here at the Delta 3232 button, and you find every uh, donor who is available with this deletion. So this is very easy and simple, and works very well. This is are uh, the requests from uh, the last two years, which are received, and where I use the donor uh, DKMS donor navigator, and you see that we have uh, here in uh, this this and, uh, this. Uh, um, patient who have found um, homozygous donors, it's 45% of all requests we were successful. Yeah? And this is a, um, much more feasible to find donors now. And uh, what would we do with, with patients who have no CCR5 Delta 32 uh, homozygous um, uh, donor? So we can learn from other uh, uh, so research groups, for example, for the, uh, the people who make uh, gene therapy, this is uh, the Sangamo trial, um, where uh, HIV infectors received gene-edited uh, cells with zinc finger, where the CCR5 delta, uh, the CCR5 receptor is partly knocked down. Then they stopped the, the treatment, the anti therapy. The patient rebounded, but one didn't rebound, uh, well, had a... Um, spontaneous control of the virus, and this uh, participant was the CC5 heterozygous for the Delta 32 deletion. And they were able to repeat this in another patient, the same procedure. Uh, they received uh, uh, this manipulated cells, uh, stopped treatment, and uh, they he developed a spontaneous control um, of the virus. So uh, if you take into account that um, the, the heterozygous uh, 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 is much more, it's, it's more than 10% uh, and they make the same calculation, you were able to find more than 45% uh, of all of the requested donors heterozygous for, for HLI matching. So the probability is much more higher. And if you combine this search together with gene therapy, uh, you can uh, improve this, uh, this procedure much more in an allergenic setting. Another thing what the Sangamatru group did is uh, that they combined this, uh, this transfer of gene edited cells together with the cytoreductive uh, therapy, and they want to enrich these uh, cells uh, because they want to uh, give them a selective advantage against other cells and to grow up and to enrich. This is the main problem of all uh, gene edited cells that you have only a very small amount of cells which have this, uh, this uh, editing. So, and uh, another thing what I saw yesterday at the EBMT is uh, the, yeah, the adaptive T cell transfer from, from third party donors. So in this setting, um, up there, um, this is um, used to treat CMV reactivation and allergenic transplantation. And they took uh, uh, cells from a third party, not, uh, um, not the donor, uh, uh, which have a high um, uh, reactivity against CMV, can uh, expand them, select them, and give them the patient back. 
in HRE settings, it's, I think it's uh, possible to think about um, allergenic transplantation for um, people who have no CCR5 Delta 32 HLA matching donor, but you can also give uh, nearly matching HLA matching uh, CCR5 boost of cells after the transplantation if you're using this, uh, the same approach. So uh, the first allergenic transplantation HRE patients is, was performed in the early 80s and uh, every uh, year new things come uh, here and uh, some of these uh, findings uh, people are involved here in this room and um, so probably there's no, no end in sight so there, there are many things uh, still in, in, uh, in flow and uh, yeah <coughs> this Donor search is now much more easier for us to do in using the DKMS navigator and the probability is up to 50% in Caucasians. We're looking under uh, um, uh, regions. Uh, we come to the next presentation of corporate uh, that's much, probably much more successful. And um, yeah, that's what I say, the, the combining of uh, these findings together with uh, gene therapy. Still is no uh, trial, to my knowledge, no trial open where gene therapy is combined with allergenic transplantation and uh, the additive cell, uh, cell transfer is a thing which we can think about. So, um, uh, last thing, the outlook. Um, if you uh, think back on the EBMT data, you saw that 111 uh, patients received uh, uh, under commission of the EBMT allergenic transplantation HIV patient. And uh, to, I had knowledge of probably about five of them were uh, organized uh, this donor screening. So the most, most 90% were unaware of the CCR5 screening uh, made the transplantation and uh, so this is a pity that uh, in these uh, these are lost candidates for for this approach and uh, that's what I say that there's no gene therapy for an elegant setting and uh, this is a copy from from PubMed if you are combining the search HRV and cure you find that uh, after 2009 when the brown uh, case was published there was a, a rush in in publications in, in, uh, pub, uh, in PubMed and um, so the topic is there and uh, our group of Epistem could uh, improve and, uh, and give uh, many aspects of this cure aspects for, for other groups for gene therapy and um, I wonder why it is uh, the cure initiative of the International AIDS Society these are all nice people there uh, on the picture, uh, but uh, if you look uh, closely, there's no hematologist or no one who is involved in transplantation or anything. So this, uh, from official side, we uh, take into account that the, the, the International AIDS Society is something what covers uh, whole, the whole uh, development. This transplantation side is totally ignored. So thank you very much. And <laughs> questions. Do you have any questions for Laura? Yes. Um, um, it's very difficult uh, to get a, a, a donor with Delta 38 also, Delta 32. Mm. Um, another kind of uh, mutation, uh, B27. Uh, these, um, these donors um, metabolize the virus slow. Mm -hmm. Do you have another information uh, combined? Um, Heterozygot, uh, uh, CCR5? And no. no. No, to my knowledge, do we have? Uh, there's no database. This database of the DKMS was uh, originally designed. Uh, for giving the transplant centers uh, more details, for, exactly for QRI1, uh, which is uh, interesting for the outcome of the transplantation, but they expanded it to the CCR5. And uh, yeah, but I think in, in terms of individualized medicine, these questions are getting more and more focused uh, in, in the future, I think. Okay. Okay. Yeah, one question that always comes up is, uh, 
was interested in. Uh, what do you think is the role of the politician in terms of that he was the resigned? Yeah, um, the, the, the data are that the heterozygous have a little uh, lower uh, CCFI expression on the surface, but not the half. So if you have just the half of the uh, gene copies, it, it doesn't mean uh, that you have only the uh, half of the CCFI expression at the surface. But the data from Sangamo, they are suggestive that uh, this deletion has something to do uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the outcome. And Probably they, we have not a linear uh, correlation between the susceptibility of, of cells and uh, the CCR5 expression. So maybe we have uh, uh, steps in this, and so that that there might be a critical amount of CCR5 uh, on the surface, which uh, could be uh, uh, possible for the infection. It's interesting to know that also the Boston patients who have the shyness were yeah. 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 Unfortunately, after treatment was stopped, there was a primary issue. Yeah. Well, finally, just a comment. I mean, this is Sangamo, and all those things that they, with all the other patients, they got only 10% protection with the heterozygous one, they had more than 30%, so yeah, yeah. which might just be at the level. Yeah, it's, we're still far away from the situation where Timothy Brown was. Uh, after 11 uh, days after the engraftment and after 60 days where he reached the 100% chimerism, there were only CCR5 negative cells in, in, the, in the patient. And you is no, except in animal model, but in, in humans it's not possible to reach this amount of uh, manipulated cells with the gene therapy. It's not possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now the next presentation is, uh, is going to be made by Vanderson Rocha. So it's my pleasure to introduce you and to, uh, to Vanderson. And to, uh, he's going to talk on CCR5 core blood typing and availability of CCR5 Delta 32 homozygous stem cells for allotransplants. Vanderson, all is yours. Even, even this. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, I will try to, during this next 15 minutes, to uh, give an, a brief overview on the cold blood transplant field and how we can also use the cold blood cells to treat patients with HIV. Um, in fact, just because uh, we are uh, in an audience that we don't have, uh, we have also uh, speak slow. Oh, it's, it's okay? Yeah. It's very high. <laughs> okay, can you hear me, Sergi? It's okay. So, uh, in fact, uh, the first cord blood transplantation was performed uh, almost 30 years ago. It was in 88 and the publication 89. So this was an HLA identical sibling donor. Uh, it's a French and American collaboration. Uh, and uh, in fact, this was the first recipient of a cold blood and he was transplanted in Paris. Uh, so this is the sister who donated the cord. This was the first time that a cold blood unit was traveling. So you can imagine this uh, container in a seat in the plane. Uh, this is the boy some um, years uh, later and he engrafted and you can see that we have celebrated the 20 years uh, some years ago, uh, Professor Elian Gluckman and Professor Holbrox Meyer and this was uh, the recipient and now he has also a boy um, and he's doing very well in his cure. So this uh, in fact opened the field of cold blood cells uh, but in fact this was a case of a donor 
in the family donating a cord blood for the patient. But after this, around 92, 94, there were banks uh, collecting cord blood for unrelated use. It means that we could use cord blood not only in the familiar uh, situation, but also unrelated. And since at that time, we haven't seen many graft host disease, so there was this possibility of using even HLA incompatible grafts to transplant patients. So the cord blood banks were established at that time, 92 to 94, mainly in New York, Barcelona, Serge is here, with uh, Juan Garcia, who was there, Dusseldorf, uh, also Milan and Paris. So uh, there were some Europeans and also uh, some uh, American banks. And the advantage of the cold blood use, because the grafts are available, immediate use, they can be stored for many years, and there are many data showing that even 20 years of 25 years after uh, fro uh, uh, freezing the, the cells, they are available for transplantation. Uh, of course, they are tested for infectious markers and HLA before transplant, and this is very easy because an unrelated donor will have to wait for all these steps. And of course, there is uh, absence of ethical problems because the donors, they don't have problems with the donors. But where is the place of cold blood? In fact, uh, when we are looking for an, uh, a donor for a patient who needs an allogeneic transplant, you can find around in families, 30% of uh, the patients you have, if they have, of course, uh, siblings, you can find an HLA identical sibling. You can extend to f other family members. Uh, and then if you do not find a naturally identical sibling, you go for registries. And uh, nowadays we have 25 million uh, adult donors in registries all over the world. Uh, and uh, you are searching for uh, donors who are 9 of 10 or the best 10 of 10. And then it will depends on the ethnicity of the patients. Here is 40%, but it can vary from even 20% if you have, a, for example, a black, uh, a black or an Asian, uh, to 70% uh, if it's a Caucasian patient. And of course, some of those patients will not have donors. And nowadays, you can find also other possibilities for those patients. You can find cold blood because you can do incompatible transplants, an haploidentical donor, or even an HLA mismatched unrelated donor. So nowadays, we say that for all patients, we will find donors. This is not more a, a problem. So in fact, you can see that cord and haplo nowadays are the second or the third option depending on the transplant centers and the disease. After an HLA identical sibling, an unrelated donor, then you can have these other possibilities. Some centers now are already doing after HLA identical sibling, uh, or that going directly to cord, such as Minnesota in, in the United States, or going directly to HAPRO, even not looking for unrelated donors, because the results have been very similar of all these strategies. And one thing that is very important in CORD, and this is a very old paper, but it's still, uh, we find the same results. This was done uh, in 97 at the very beginning of CORDs. Uh, you can see these were 165 related transplants. And uh, what we have found is that cell dose and HLA are very important factors to the outcomes of cold blood for engraftment and also for survival. So nowadays, uh, since the cell dose is very important, uh, you cannot find just one unit for a pa an adult patient because it's the number of total cells and the kilos, okay? So for example, United States, 80 to 90% of recipients receive two double units. In Europe, because of the weight. Uh, in Europe, it's around 60%. You can find two doubles and one, or one unit for 40%. In Japan, almost all recipients receive a single unit because they are small and you have uh, enough cell dose. So in fact, it depends on the cell dose for the patients. We, what, what we have found is that the minimum cell dose to transplant a patient should be three, 10 times to the seventh nucleated cells per kilo. So if you have one unit with the cell, you go ahead. If not, you choose an, a double cord or other uh, possibilities. So the other possibilities are, are double cord blood units. If you cannot find a single unit, so you go for double units, and the minimum should also be around 3 to 3.5. Then you have the other possibilities, the haplocords, and the haplocords we can have one or two units transplanted with CD34 selected cells. 
Uh, you can have also other possibilities, one cold blood expanded in vitro uh, and one non-expanded cold blood, two cold blood expanded, and also there are some other platforms that are still experimental, increasing the homing of the cells, such as fecalization, prostaglandins, even intra-bone injection uh, of one unit and not of the other one. So these are the possibilities of using cords. You can see that there are many possibilities. And uh, so this is just to show you in the registry that still have most of the cords are performed in children and are single as expected. And in adults, this is also the results of the Eurocode registry. You can see that uh, about 60% uh, of the, the adults, this is in the other graph, are receiving double uh, and still uh, patients receiving single depending the cell dose. Also, how do we do uh, this kind of transplantation? In adults, you can see this RIC means reduced intensity condition regimen. You can see that most, uh, many of the cold blood transplants in adults are using reduced intensity condition regimen. Uh, of course, when the patients are younger, we prefer to do myel ablation. Uh, but these are techniques of transplantation, and uh, I'm not going to use uh, Trent in all the details. Well, but what about the use of cold blood? Uh, in the setting of HIV. And so I, I'm going briefly to present the data uh, that Rafael Duarte has uh, given, uh, and he, it's published in the Lancet HIV uh, last year, showing in fact there was a patient with uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma uh, who was a, a candidate for transplantation. And what they have done, uh, they have uh, looked at the possibility of donors, uh, and in fact, in the, this patient uh, were able to find two cold blood units. And uh, this was, if I remember well, you can correct me, it was in the stem side cold blood bank. Uh, those units uh, were uh, homozygous. Uh, and then they decided to use the haplocode protocol because it's quite famous here in Spain because it was described by uh, Fernandez in, in Porto Riero. Uh, so uh, in fact, they were able to use uh, mismatched cords and a haplo to do this transplantation. Uh, and here are the total number of cells. You can see that there were quite uh, good numbers. It was more than three, 205 plus 164. So it means 3.5. It's what we said that it's better to have a minimum cell dose of 3.5, around 3.5. CD34, it was after 0.5 and 0.2. It means uh, 0.8, that it's also good numbers. And also, uh, it shows that the CFUGM was also very good. And this was the condition regimen that they used. It was a reduced intensity condition regimen, frudarabin, busulfan, cyclophosphamide, ATG, with cyclosporine steroids uh, for the GVHD uh, prophylaxis, and of course using antimicrobial prophylaxis. And these are uh, what happened with the patient. You can see that here are, are the uh, lymphocytes in the chimeris. The chimeris will uh, look for the percentage of the donor cells. So, uh, in fact, the patient. Uh, you can see that there was a wave of engraftment of CD34. And why we do this kind of transplants? Because we want to protect the patient against the aplasia, that we know that in cold blood we have a delayed engraftment. So this first wave of transplantation of haplo CD34 appeared. You can see at day 10. Uh, and then after this, there was an increase of one of the units, this was the first cold blood unit, uh, has increased and then the haplo cells have disappeared with the increased number uh, of cells of the cold blood unit, one that was a uh, homozygous for CD uh, for Delta 32. Uh, and after this, in fact, they have measured all uh, the uh, possibility uh, presence of the HIV, and you can see here this is 15 days before transplant, and around 76 days after transplant, uh, in fact, there were uh, almost a disappearance of the virus. Uh, and in fact, uh, this, the patient unfortunately died 
uh, of relapse of the disease and it was possible to show uh, also that uh, uh, this patient, uh, the relapse, uh, I think the patient died around three months after transplant. So uh, I'm not going to enter in all the details because I understand nothing about the reservoir of HIV. I'm just learning. Uh, but uh, in fact, it was possible to show uh, that this kind of transplantation was feasible and that you could use this uh, squad blood cells, uh, in fact, <coughs> to transplant this patient. So, but what, what is the frequency and, and uh, uh, Guillermo has already talked about this. We have most of the, the uh, CCR5 uh, homozygous are in Northern uh, Europe. Uh, and uh, you can see that this is the prevalence of the CCR5. Uh, so uh, what we have done is to look in Europe uh, how many uh, and the possibility of having cold blood uh, units uh, that are uh, homozygous uh, or heterozygous for CCR5. And uh, in, in Spain uh, uh, has uh, a, pr uh, a project of doing uh, CCR5 typing of cord blood unit, and this has also been presented uh, by Rafael uh, in uh, EBMT. You can see uh, almost 25,000 units uh, have been typed for CCR5. We have uh, 158 units that are homozygous and 3, 000, around 3,000 units that are uh, heterozygous, this is in Spain, oh, uh, and uh, Spanish, uh, and uh, around 22,000 uh, wild type. What about other places? So in the AMFA project, what we have, we have typed around, uh, we have in the samples 5,000, almost 6,000 units. We have already typed around 4,000 and we still ongoing with the Dusseldorf because we have received uh, these samples recently, but in this population uh, of around uh, 3,000 units tested, we have around uh, 40 uh, homozygous and 590 uh, heterozygous. But if you put all the uh, units available that are typed, and I put here the stem site based on some publications, we can see that we have a total of around 55 thousand units that are available uh, and if you look at the number of homozygous is around 400 uh, and of course uh, the heterozygous I don't know the numbers but it would be around 4,000 uh, more than 4,000 4, heterozygous uh, also that can be used uh, in this situation. One of the advantages of the cold blood is the mismatch so uh, I think it's very important to uh, calculate, and this was being done on the cell dose on the HLA, since we can do uh, some HLA disparities prob uh, in this situation, probably can use a higher number of these homozygous. You can see, for example, in the case of, uh, Duce, uh, of, in the case of Barcelona, they were four of six, both of the units were four of six uh, HLA typed. Uh, and there was a calculation by Gonzalez et al. that if you have around, and this is what we have nowadays, we have around 400,000 units to 600,000 units available for transplantation all over the world, and then we can find around 2,000 to 4,000 units that are homozygous. So what are the conclusions? Uh, in fact, cord blood is an alternative source for transplantation in adults with HIV and hematological malignancies. The adult stem cell donors and the cord blood units should be worldwide available because it would facilitate for the transplant centers when you are looking in BMDW, that it's the bone marrow donor worldwide, it's much easier to think on the CCR5 homozygous or heterozygous and choose the adults or the cord blood units that you can use. Of course, we are discussing this with the Spanish program, the stem site, DKMS, uh, and Gero uh, will help me with BMDW to try to put everything uh, in this uh, website that it will be easily uh, uh, used for transplantation. And of course, uh, the importance of the viral monitoring after transplant uh, with the EPSTEM project. So I would like to thank uh, the collaboration, Raphael, for giving me the slides, the Cod Blood Banks in London, Finland, Sweden, Dusseldorf, and of course, the AMPRA project. Thank you. This is our only public, but of course we are not very interested to look for uh, Asia because we know that the prevalence is very low, so probably we should concentrate more in European uh, cold blood banks.
And that's, that's the reason we have the money only to type some of the cases. And uh, we have chosen the countries uh, in which we think that the prevalence is higher. Do you know the, the plans of the uh, New York Coral Bank or American uh, Coral Bank about the... No, in fact, you know, uh, I don't know what Pablo Rubinstein is trying to, to, to do, but uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, nowadays the cold blood banks are facing financial problems, uh, and I'm not very sure that this is uh, something that they are thinking about. Probably, Serge, I don't know what you think. I don't know if what Pablo is. The stem cell data actually is the stem cell plus MD Anderson. Yes, the stem cell is. The stem cell is according to the American consumption plus Australia. Yes, okay. So this 25,000 is MD Anderson, Duke, and Australia as well. Okay. Thank you. And I, I, want, I want to introduce you a, a, another speaker. Our next speaker is Anne-Marie Wensi, which is a co-chair of EPSTEM project, actually. And she will be talking, he's working in, in, in Utrecht, in the Netherlands. And she will be talking on the management of HIV-infected patients requiring an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Anne-Marie. Thank you. Can I have this one? And the machine. That's challenging. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. I have one important uh, disclaimer. Um, I'm bringing the perspective of um, a clinical virologist, so I'm no way a hematology expert. And although I do work a lot with our hematology department, I know it's very complex. So I haven't even tried to touch that. So I'm going to very much talk about the virology perspective because I feel uh, comfortable there. And I also think that's probably for you uh, also a very interesting uh, looking at the experience and the uh, expertise that you already have. So if we perform SCT in HIV-infected patients, I think there are a, a lot of things to consider. And I'm always a very much from the, of the uh, multidisciplinary approach. I think you know, by working together, we can actually have a lot of synergistic effects. And <coughs> if I look from the uh, experience that we have in Utrecht, we have a multidisciplinary team, which is the hematologist, the infectious disease specialist, who actually sees the HIV-infected patients, but also the clinical virologist, and also very important, the um, uh, pharmacist. And on top of that, actually specialized nurses uh, and the transplant coordinator. And all of these people have been really very important to um, discuss uh, the clinical approach. On top of that, we have also, and that was a little bit uh, new for us as clinicians, we have brought in the scientists in the room. Uh, because it's such a complex and interesting new field and there's not always evidence there. So um, it was the first time that we actually discussed clinical patients in the context of researchers as well. And so what are some of the main topics that we have discussed during the procedures? These are the ethical considerations, which I think are actually the starting point of anything you do. And then the assessment of viral tropism, uh, especially looking at the, the case of Gero and the Berlin patients, in which we do think that the viral tropism was uh, uh, very important. The choice of SCT procedure, which is of course the starting point of anything you do. The donor search related to that. Um, the anticipation on drug-drug interactions, which is very complex, antiretroviral therapy options, and viral monitoring during the procedure, and then uh, um, maybe a possible treatment interruption. There are many more aspects, but these are just the ones I would like to highlight. So the ethical consideration, <coughs> for us it was very clear that the indication for the SCT is the hematological uh, complication. And we get a lot of calls also from patients who do not have any hematological disorder and would like to have an SCT. And we also get calls from patients who have a hematological disorder who actually not should not have an SCT. So, you know, there's a lot of mixing. And I think for a hematologist, this is very clear. But for other people in that context, this may not be that clear. 
So um, the plan is to improve the hematological uh, condition, and um, I think that's that's the first thing. Secondary, it gives you in HIV-infected patients a unique opportunity um, to ad perform additional sampling to study the effects on the HIV infection, and more specifically the persistence of the reservoir and potentially maybe a cure, as has been seen in the Berlin patient. So in this, uh, there's always very important um, that the SCT is a clinical procedure that you would do anyway. On top of that, there's the discussion on the HIV infection. And uh, many IRB committees we have learned um, over the last two years in Europe consider persistence of HIV not very different from the persistence of any other viral infection and say this is a clinical question. And I think it's very important to, to talk in this multidisciplinary um, team um, what is considered clinical care and what's considered research. I've learned that the hematologists sometimes see things as uh, research while the HIV specialists say, no, this is our standard of care. And we have to be very careful. You do not limit even your clinical procedure by what you put uh, to your IRB as, um, uh, as research. And in many centers um, in Europe, we have learned that actually the ethical committees are very much willing to work with you and to see what approach should be chosen, because for them it's also new and it's, it's very much on, on the, on the uh, there's not a lot of clinical experience and also not a lot of ethical experience. So I would very much advise to go up front and to discuss with your IRB. Um, then, if you look at the viral uh, co-receptor tropism, all the other presentations already touched on this, on this item. I just made a short summary. What does it actually already uh, mean? Well, the viral envelope protein, so the proteins that actually um, are on the uh, um, surface of the virus, the GP120, it binds to the CD4 receptor. And in that way, only cells with the CD4 receptor can be infected by HIV. But there's a second receptor um, uh, is needed for invasion of the virus of the cell. And actually the, second, the connection with the second receptor is also done by the GP120, but a very variable region. And that's the V4, that's the variable region. And that, depending on the, the charge of that region, you get either connection to the uh, CCR5 receptor or the CXCR4. <coughs> And then in a patient, what you often see if a person is recently infected with HIV, the virus actually uses the uh, CCR5 uh, co-receptor. We call that R5 tropic virus. Uh, and over time, if the immune system deteriorates, we actually see uh, X4 virus popping up. In the past, we thought that patients became ill because of this uh, co-receptor switch. Now we actually think that changes in the immune system induce the viral change. And this is often not just one mutation, but often it's a multiple mutations in this variable region. And then um, the, the virus may be uh, X4-tropic. What actually often also happens is that the virus actually can use both co-receptors, and then you have the dual tropic tropism. And in specific patients, you can have mixes of all these variants, and then you have mixed tropism. What about the uh, CCR5 uh, host genotype? Well, most patients have just uh, normal um, alleles and they have normal uh, expression of the CCR5 receptor on their cells. And then you see standard HIV progression. In a subset of patients, there's the deletion present in one of the alleles, and then you're heterozygous. And these are actually patients that for HIV often have long-term uh, non-progression and delayed disease progression. Whether this is related to the size of the viral reservoir, already um, Gero touched upon it, we don't really know, but is it, at least there, is, there are less cells expressing CCR5, and it may be that this reservoir is smaller in these patients. Then there is about um, less than 2% of the Caucasian population who actually have, has this deletion in both alleles. And often people say that these people are uh, resistant to HIV which is not completely true. There are about 14 cases in the world described of patients with this homozygous uh, deletion who are actually infected with HIV, but then with HIV variants that can use the CXCR4 receptor. So the, 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 the determination of tropism, how is it working in clinical practice? It's actually a bit disappointing. It's just not one test. It's, it's quite complex. You have different assays that you could use. You could use phenotypic assays 
which um, actually assess the co-receptor uses. You can do that if you have a lot of PBMCs of your patients and you can co-culture them and then even you know, uh, put these viruses into different cell lines and to assess the co-receptor usage. And if the patient, um, if you don't have any cells uh, before the SCT procedure, what you could do is what we have done in the Berlin patient is that you actually make a reconstruction of the viruses that are present based on sequence analysis that has been performed. You can actually make the viruses, at least the envelopes that are present in a patient, put those in a viral clone and then perform the um, tropism phenotypic assays. And we call that a Utrecht drop chase. There are also genotypic assays, which are of course less complex to perform, but what's really important is that they only give a prediction of the tropism. And predictions have very much to do with techniques and also with cutoffs. So you can this, do this on the RNA, you can do this on the DNA, and you can do this as a population sequence technique or an ultra deep technique. And it really differs. And uh, it's also a matter of interpretation uh, because you then have the sequence, but to translate that into a tropism, you, uh, you really have to, um, to use different algorithms. And one of the, I think, the preferred method, in my opinion, is the Gino Tufino co-receptor algorithm. It's made by a combination of German virologists and biostatisticians. And they have, it's based on the charge uh, that's present on the uh, amino acids. And um, the, the, the algorithm has a cutoff. But the problem is that the cutoff has been defined for use of CCR5 co-receptor blockers that we use for treatment of HIV. And that means they are very conservative, these cutoffs, because, uh, but not, they're not uh, meant for HIV cure strategies. And also the guidelines that, are, that we actually have written uh, on the interpretation of the co-receptor test are actually very much based on the use of the drug and not based on, on, on any cure strategy. Cutoffs are also different uh, on which technique you use. Do you do um, standard sequencing or ultra-deep sequencing? And the result is given, um, not very clear, but it's, a, uh, or not very, let's say it's clear, but it's not intuitive. It's a false positive rate. And that means the probability of classifying an R5 tropic virus as falsely as X4. And if you vary the threshold, uh, it also um, very much changes not only the specificity, but also the sensitivity of your X4 prediction. So I have, knowing that, so if you are able to go through this interpretation, uh, you are not there yet, actually. And we can see that in the case of the Berlin patient uh, from uh, Gero, the population genotype predicted that an R5 tropic virus was present. And then later on, a deep sequencing was uh, performed, and there a minority of viruses was predicted to be X4. There were no cells uh, from pre preceding the SCT uh, uh, present anymore, so we did a TROP trace based on the sequences that we found in the deep sequencing test. We constructed the viruses and tested those, and then we found actually that these minority of X4 predicted variants in actually in vivo were not able to use the X4 um, receptor, which may ha have been related also to the success in this patient. If we then look at the second case, this is actually the ASCEN patient, and there you saw the same uh, actually pattern, that the population genotype, which works really well if you want to decide on the use of the CCR5 inhibitor, but for cure research it's different. You see here in the deep sequencing also X4 variants. And um, here also the virus culture has not been performed, but the TROP trace has been performed and will be, uh, the results will be uh, presented at, in May at the HIV hepatitis meeting in Rome. Then the Barcelona case of Duarte, here actually <coughs> many more tests were performed and they were all congruent. That's also nice eh, if you have in all the tests the same results. And for the Boston patients, actually all these in-depth uh, tropism determinations were not performed. So it's, it's not just one test, it's really a complex uh, assessment. Then the SCT procedure, which is of course uh, also a very complex uh, assessment. I think the choice of procedure is based on the hematological condition. That's, that's really the starting point again. But also local experience is very much uh, important. And you should really question whether you want to do a certain approach because you only have maybe 
uh, core blood available with uh, a homozygous CCR5 deletion if you have never done that before. I think it's, it's, it's a really an important discussion that you should do in your team and put the hematological condition on one. Uh, in, in our, uh, it's, I cannot really say experience, but based on results we have seen this thus far, we think that the condition the choice of the donor and the actual procedure probably all have influence on the HIV reservoir. But no firm conclusions can be made at this time. And that means that we cannot uh, say this is a preferred method that actually from a virological perspective would give the most uh, success rate for your patients to maybe have a possible HIV cure. So there, I think, guidance from experienced hematologists who have done different procedures and infectious disease specialists uh, should be uh, consulted and that you can do that, in the, for instance, in the EpiStem project. Then the actual donor search, we already heard from the other presentations, uh, had a lot of information about this. There's an increased amount of adult donors, I think uh, over a million now, and um, core bloods, about uh, 30,000 that have been typed for CCO5. Um, if there is a donor and has not been typed, it's possible to do that, and it's also possible to do that really quickly and also uh, actually on any donor wherever present in the world. So uh, you should not uh, be refrained from that. And what we have learned, and you know that from HLA typing, is that confirmation testing is actually uh, essential. There are also diff different techniques to assess the CCO5 um, um, donor uh, t uh, genotype. So um, once you do the HLA typing, it's very um, good time-wise to do then also the confirmation at the same time. Then the drug-drug interaction. A multiple drug-drug interaction may occur between actually the myoablative drugs and drugs that may be started during the SCT uh, for uh, to handle toxicity or infections that may occur during the procedure or after the procedure. And uh, preferably HIV therapy should be continued because then you suppress the virus and you have less chance for uh, viral tropism switches to occur. And in Epistem we have uh, made an um, extensive list with all the uh, different routes of metabolism and elimination uh, um, ways of the drugs, both of the myoablative and the antiretroviral drugs to actually look for potential interactions if it has not yet been tested for. And from that, there is a, a table with a potential drug-drug interaction that is available and people can use. Um, I think here again, antiretroviral therapy is second to any uh, choice of drugs for the hematological procedure or drugs that you need to fight infections or toxicity because the patient is not dying of HIV, the patient may die if the hematological procedure is not uh, going well. Uh, so having said that, I think any change of the antiretroviral therapy should be performed in time if possible um, to allow for steady state and to also to know what you can expect in drug-drug interaction, but also to avoid acute toxicity during <coughs> your SCT procedure. And then it is very difficult which drug is uh, 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 giving the toxicity. So you may already at least you know, change a month uh, before the procedure or even earlier. So even if you don't want to change uh, your antiretroviral therapy, I think it's uh, needed to discuss upfront whether uh, certain conditions may appear during the whole procedure that actually at that time would force you to change therapy. And then um, you should look at the activity of complete regimen because it's not always possible to just change one of the antiretroviral drugs. Most patients are treated with at least three drugs and the success of the regimen is very much also dependent on the interaction between drugs. So it may be more complex than just getting one drug out and one other drug in. And in that context, you have to look at historical drug resistance tests for HIV, but also at uh, maybe viral rebounds. Uh, and these times, maybe no resistance testing has been performed because at that time, the clinician had multiple options for the HIV therapy. But now you are in a situation with multiple drug-drug interaction and you have less options. So you may want to go back to stored uh, samples to, to explore all options. And this is something, you know, you don't have the time for at, at the time you have a toxicity problem. So really try to do that up front. 
Then viral monitoring, well, that should be performed uh, with your standard HIV plasma viral load assay, HIV RNA assay. But there is actually sometimes a difference between the actual results that are reported in clinical practice and the raw results that come from the machine. So often you get like a, um, a test result, uh, the, this patient is undetectable, which is then either below 50, 40 or 20 copies. But the actual test result gives uh, also um, 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 an indication which is not quantitative. So you can have a, a test result which actually says no target detected, which means there's actually nothing present, which is different than below 20 or below 50. It's very good to discuss this with your virologist because many labs do not store these results. So if you don't ask it up front, they may be lost. And they may be in, uh, interesting for you if you want to monitor the viral reservoirs. There are also more ultra-sensitive tests available than the standard viral load assays, but these are often not clinically accredited. So how do you monitor then persistence? Huh? HIV serology is not suitable. People may lose um, their uh, antibody expression and that uh, has more to do with control of the virus in the context of drugs and less to do probably with a, with a potential HIV cure. If you don't find with the various uh, sensitive techniques HIV in the plasma, ideally you should go for testing uh, of the viral reservoirs and you could think of DNA testing or maybe tissues and I think you will probably, uh, Maria will um, go into depth there. Um, we have to realize there are no clinically accredited assays for this. So you're really looking at validated research tests. And also interpretation of these tests should be done in a multidisciplinary way and preferably in a standardized collaborative approach, as APISTEM, of course. <laughs> so this reservoir testing, uh, it, it, we have a lot of questions there. So if you would consider to stop antiretroviral therapy because your patient is in remission for his hematological condition and then you would think he's potentially cured of HIV, um, how often or how long should you test uh, for, the res for a, a viral rebound to occur? Do you ever test now the Berlin patient still, do you? It's not my patient. It's not your patient anymore. But you, 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 <laughs> he considers you his best friend, isn't it? But, uh, I know uh, when we talked last time, we didn't perform the tests. There's a certain time point you say, now my patient is cured, I'm not testing anymore. And what parameters should be tested before analytical treatment is actually considered anyway? And should additional interventions be performed before you stop? and which parameters should be monitored. And if you have performed it and you have a viral rebound, should you immediately rush into new antiretroviral therapy or should you maybe allow a time for the host immune system to control HIV? I think these are a lot of questions are unanswered at this time point. Um, within, within Epistem we're working on a guidance, not to give solutions, but to give you an idea in which considerations are there and uh, what you could think of before um, you do such a thing. So in conclusion, I think management of uh, stem cell transplantation in HIV infected patients adds an additional layer of complexity to a procedure which is already complex. Um, it's a multidisciplinary approach, in my opinion, is warranted and I think the experience of other centers may be crucial and is there available. So if you're planning such a thing, I think it's, it's very, uh, we invite you to, to, to join us and to learn from us. It's also in EpiStem possible if you already have a patient uh, transplanted still to join the program. So. And finally, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, our group in Utrecht there in with the pictures in the corner, especially Petra and Kobus, have done a lot of experiments uh, on, our patient, on our materials from our patients. Uh, but also uh, Javier, my co-PI, and uh, all other investigators involved in EPISTEM. So, thank you. Um, we don't know. 
Um, but the may, uh, you have to consider a few things. Um, there are some, guy, uh, some ideas, if you look at literature, that it could be helpful huh? in any way in an SCT procedure, even though a patient would not have HIV maybe. Mm -hmm. But you also have to look at potential drug-drug interaction and you know, what you're adding to the regimen of a patient. So I think it's a balanced uh, decision that you really should make uh, looking at, at the clinical picture of one specific patient. And I don't think there's one answer applicable for every patient. Yeah. And, and just to point out that we did that, of course, in the, together with infectious disease and we did it only in the patients with a R5 virus troposin. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, next speaker will be uh, Maria Salgado from the AIDS Research Institute, Ursicaixa, in Barcelona. You all know, and we will address uh, ultra-sensitive HIV the detection, finding the needle in the haystack. Your yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, hi everyone. Hi everyone. Um, now my, my presentation is going more from the clinic to the lab to understand a little bit more how we measure the reservoir uh, later on in the lab. How all this big approach of doing a transplantation, how can we go further and measure the reservoir and, thin, and, and, and at, at the end find if we really moving the virus and we are finding, curing the, the HIV. So I'm going to show you some of the parameters that we measure in the lab and what's the importance of all of this one. So the first parameter actually that I think all of you know already is the, the plasma viral load. The plasma viral load was described in 1997 from John Mellors. Um, and I think is one of the best parameters that we are using in HIV follow up in clinic and it's the great market to uh, follow the HIV replication in the clinic. So this is like probably is very familiar for all of you and you can see how everyone, I mean, you saw how at the beginning of the infection um, the viral load of the patients are very high and when you start the treatment and then they start the treatment, the viral load they start to decay actually in two different phases and go to undetectable levels, right? But at the, at the same time, all of us know that if we stop the antiretroviral treatment, in some point, this viral load is going to go up again and, and is the perfect market for the viral replication. So the regular way to measure the viral load is uh, getting blood from the patient and with one ml of plasma, we go for an amplification for a quantitative PCR and we, uh, with a specific primers for HIV and we can quantify the amount of HIV in plasma, right? So in 2008, uh, Sarah Palmer developed a new assay which is called ultrasensitive viral load. And this assay is going a bit farther from the regular viral load that you all know. So in this assay, um, we collect a bit more of blood and to get at the end 9 ml of plasma. And do we uh, concentrate the, this plasma in, to concentrate the, plas the, the virus. And we go and do the, the, um, the same PCR, the specific HIV PCR, right? So when we, sh we describe and she saw uh, is that this is the limit of detection that the, the regular viral load SA has, that is 50 copies per ml. Now some of the techniques have 20 copies per ml. But still what she saw is there is a lot of things happening behind this limit of detection. For most of the patients, and even during seven years of treatment, still a small amounts of viral replication were detected, the viral load was detected. So that tells us actually that something else is happening behind all, all the um, follow-up that we are seeing and we are just measuring with the viral law, right? So uh, in this slide, this is pressing a little bit more the physiological or the HIV infection further than, than just check the viral replication in the plasma. So this is what is happening in the cells. Uh, this represents the, the tissue cells and this in blue we have kind of the cells that are actively producing virus. 
and those are very, like the amount is very high in previously to the antiretroviral treatment. And when the treatment is started, those, that, 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 those cells that are actively replicating and, and, and producing virus decrease a lot. And at the end, in the third and fourth phase, in the phase that uh, we see the suppression with the viral load, we have saw some called resting CD40 cells or resting cells that are producing some small amount of virus, but is not going further and, and producing virus in high amount or high quantity. Right, so in here I express a little bit more um, what is happening. So the first group of cells, the activity C40 cells that are infected and producing virus are expressing here and those cells can um, go, uh, I mean, can express the, can, can, the virus can replicate in there and go further and kill the cell indeed. Or some of those cells can go to a resting state and have a long, li long half life and survive with integrated virus in, in there. Other way to get uh, this state of survival cells with uh, virus integrated in there is a direct infection, but th that, uh, that, way that, uh, that way is uh, less frequent, actually. And the other way that um, the virus can persist in the cells is for homostatic proliferation. Those cells that uh, were infected that with integrated virus can even replicate in, in like split in different phases and can increase the viral reservoir later on. So going here, uh, we are mostly interested in, in this kind of phase, the phase that uh, the viral load is undetectable, but still uh, if we go further and see uh, the cells, we can detect virus in there. So the way that we measure this in the, in the lab is expressed, here is what I told you before, like the plasma viremia is, is uh, we measure the virus that is actively replicating. And other thing that we measure is the uh, cell-associated DNA. This uh, is uh, formed with the integrated uh, linear DNA, integrated cellular DNA, and the integrated uh, DNA. And a step forward is when once the DNA is integrated, it can produce virus, and the first step is produce the RNA of the, the viral RNA, and we can measure that as well. And the last step could be um, to measure the replication competent virus that is coming out of that. And this is something that we do in vitro. We, extract, uh, we, we get the cells from the patients and we activate them and we see if, if some replication competent virus are coming out of that. So first two, first two uh, steps, the, the, both the cell associated DNA and cell associated RNA, are measured with PCR. But now in the lab we have a special PCR. It's called a digital droplet PCR. And the way that we work is we get DNA or RNA from the patients and we uh, put the, this DNA in, in droplets, in small droplets where are specific, um, specific primers for HIV and there are other rea uh, all the, um, the reagents that we need to do the PCR. So we do a stochastic dilutions to get at the end just one template per droplet. So in, one of the, in each of these droplets is generating a, a whole isolated PCR that we are measuring later. So we do the amplification and later we have um, a reader that is giving us a kind of this kind of plots. And one, each, of this is, uh, uh, this, each of these dots are one specific amplification and at the end we have a quantitative way to, to measure the HIV, the pro, the either provider DNA or cell associated RNA in the virus, and it's absolute. We don't need a, a curve to, to relatively do this. And this technique we saw in the lab that actually is very clean, is um, very difficult to get any contaminations, very sensitive and very specific for, for HIV. Doing this, uh, these are our piece of results from our lab actually, we measure the, um, the provider DNA, the total DNA in 320 patients. And we saw that more than 85% of the patients, we can detect virus. Patients that are on regular treatment, we can detect virus. And the, the median is around 100 copies per million of CD, or in this case, PBMCs. Some of the, like a small amount of the patients, we cannot detect. But this is something that is happening in other labs as well, like around a small amount, we, we cannot detect the virus, but still, the more than 95% of, of, of the patients, we can detect very easy, like the big amount of virus. 
this uh, this graph is showing actually the uh, cell associated RNA as well. This is coming from uh, a study from Dr. Margolis that uh, tested a, a viral reactivator in vitro, and he saw how uh, in the patients that this is kind, this is the baseline for cell associated RNA, and he detected cell associated RNA in all the patients. And when he gave this uh, drug called Borinostat, so how the the, the cells produce a higher amount, higher amount of uh, RNA, so it was a production of the virus in the cell. And actually this, uh, this, is a, this, this study shows us that uh, one of the things that we can move easier, easier way is the cell associated RNA, the expression of, this, of the RNA from the cells, the viral RNA from the cells that are infected and let them live infected. Going back to here, uh, as I said before, we can measure the amount of virus that actually are replication competent in vitro, right? So we get PBMCs from patients, we get the CD40 cells, the, the resting CD40 cells. As I said before, some of them are going to have integrated the, the proviral DNA, and we do different dilutions to them, are able to measure the, the amount of virus that we have. So we activate all, all these cells with PHA, which is a big activator of the cells, and after two weeks of culture, we are able to see if there are viruses that are giving different, different um, steps of replications. We measure this, uh, checking the amount of virus in the supernano of, of this culture. So this, uh, this essay is developed from Bob Silicano, and what he saw when they check the, um, the viral outgroup in patients um, along seven years is the they detect in regular treated patients, they detect a virus from all, all over the period of, of the treatment. And even the decay of the amount of replication competent virus out of the culture, it was decreasing very slowly. This actually in this time, that was the first um, prediction that the antiretroviral treatment was not, uh, was not going to cure HIV by itself because even with seven years of treatment, the amount of, they, they actually predict that it will need more than 70 years to eradicate the virus in, in this moment. Um, this is a study actually that compared different, all these three, well, these four, um, actually I compared viral with viral DNA techniques and what we saw is that when you check the viral outgrowth, so the virus that is replication competent and you can isolate from the patient, the amount of this virus that we get is around one replication competent virus per million CD40 cells, so PBMCs, depending. And when we check the proviral DNA, the total DNA that is integrated in the cells is higher, it's like 50, 500 times higher. So it's kind of easier to detect proviral DNA um, and some of those viruses are going to be defected and we are not going to be able to isolate those virus and replicate and be those virus replicate. So kind of just to summarize, um, the total HIV DNA is going to be the highest proportion of, of the virus that we can detect with the DNA. Those virus, some of them are going to start to replicate and to express in the, in the cells. So we can measure the total RNA that, that is expressing in the cells. And very, very small amount of those virus are going to be able to go further and uh, form particles and be able to replicate. So in the middle is going to be some uh, defective provirus and kind of one of the big questions right now in this field is like what's the size, the real size of the latent reservoir and this is something that is discussing in even like the last meetings that, that we had still. We are kind of developing all these techniques to try to get the, the real size of the latent reservoir in some point. So. Now that you know these main techniques that we, we perform in blood, let's say that we do a eradication strategy that uh, can be one of the different strategies that we are trying in, in the field. And in this case, for example, the stem cell transplantation that we are talking today. And we, in some point, we finally get like the, all the techniques that we found are undetectable, right? So, we can try, I mean, we can go and get this, that everything is undetectable. So we, we can do next, I mean, sorry. We can do, what, what can we do next? Like, it will be enough with all these techniques that we already say. Like, if all of these are undetectable, is, is ready to go. 
So the answer is no, we are still developing a lot of techniques to go further and be more sensitive to detect any, any virus that we can get. So one of the techniques that is developed for Dr. Blackson, my former mentor in, in Johns Hopkins University, is kind of the same barrel I would say that I was saying before, the culture of the virus, but doing uh, in vivo in, in, in mice. So we get PBMCs from the patients, we isolate the CD40 cells, and directly we put this C40 cells from the patients that some of them are infected with the integrate virus in there, and we put them in mice, some mice that um, are depleted for any immune response. So during, during even like two, three months, we follow the, the mice and we see if those mice are actually getting any viral load in their plasma. Um, some of the results that he saw, I mean, uh, actually these are in elite controllers, which are patients that, as you know, they have very uh, low amounts of proviral DNA, very low amounts of infection. He saw that following this, doing this, in four different elite controllers, he was able to detect some viral load in, in the mice. So this is a technique that is more sensitive and is able to get the the virus that is replication competent out of the cells in kind of an in vivo model um, way. So going back to here, uh, let's say that uh, every, all the techniques that I saw you before are, are performing blood. Let's say that we eradicate and we don't see anything in blood. So will we, will we go to stop in here? And again, I would say no. There, there are a lot of tissues that still the virus can infect. Um, so it has been described that the virus can go to brain, to skin, to gastrointestinal cells, bone marrow, genital tract, and lymph nodes, so and different tissues that we can still see. And even if you don't see any virus in blood, there are a lot of tissues that we can still check. So in the same study that I said before from, from Ericsson in plus pathogens, they check uh, the same, I mean, the amount of proviral DNA in rectal CD40 cells. I they even saw that comparing with the cells in blood, the amount of, of, C, of virus that are in the rectal cell, the, the amount of virus that are in those C40 cells that are in, in, in gold is higher. So even if we don't see any virus sometimes in, in peripheral row, we can go to the tissues and still are able to detect virus. And this is another very, very nice study that came up last year uh, where they, they do in here is they use uh, a specific antibody for SIV, for the virus in, in macaques, and they label this, they radio label this, this antibody. So the way that they do is they give this antibody to the monkeys, and they, they do immunopet to see in which part in the body are the, um, the, the I mean, the cells infected with the HIV in the, in the monkeys. So this slide is a little bit busy, but uh, in green, I try to, to show you the two, two different monkeys that are um, infected and before antiretroviral treatment. And in red, the re in red rows are the same monkeys after antiretroviral <coughs> treatment, right? So dif these are different parts in the body. Um, before the antiretroviral treatment, you can see that there are a lot of virus in the spleen. If this is called. Uh, this actually the um, T cell tissue in, in the nose, which is something new actually in the field because usually it's a part that we don't, we don't check. Or even, I mean, in bowel. So after antiviral treatment, they saw that there are different amount of virus, it's smaller, but it's still some amount of virus in colon, spleen, genital tract, nut, and lymph nodes, one of, one of the most important parts, I think, and one of the main reservoirs. So right now, in the lab, we have developed the techniques to check the virus in brain, and we use kind of the, the, the typical viral load test to, to see if there are some virus in, in brain. Uh, we check virus in bone marrow and, and in gut, and the way that we do that is kind of the same that we do in blood, but um, so we provide a DNA, we even cell associated RNA, and we check if there are some, some small amount of virus in these tissues. We don't go to the culture in these, in these tissues because we usually don't get that many cells that, that we need to do the co-culture. And, and lately we are trying to develop all the techniques for lymph nodes that even in the last conference that we've been, I think is one of the most um, developed fields right now because lymph nodes, because of the structure of the lymph node, it seems that the CTL response is not going that far away. And 
uh, could be one of the best reservoirs for the virus to hide the virus against any, any other response. So going back here, again, uh, we have some eradication strategies. We, let's say that we uh, were able to eradicate virus in blood and all also in tissue. So what's the next step? I mean, we are developing a lot of techniques, as you, as you say, but at the end, the, the, the last technique that <laughs> is telling us if we cure the patients or not is to stop the antiretroviral treatment. Um, this is the last slide. I think everyone knows this, but um, you all know the case, and we heard before the case of the, of the Berlin patient. And the curious thing is the patients from Boston were negative in most of the techniques that I just told you, and still when they stopped antiretroviral treatment after a few months, uh, the viral rebound. So as I said, at, at the end, the final, the final way to measure the reservoir will be just to stop the treatment and, and see what's happening. Still, like, ethically, we are going to, to check the reservoir in as much as we can, and I think it's very interesting even to know where the virus is hidden when we don't see in blood. So. The mouse model, no, but in, in, in ileum biosis, they check column, I think. In one, in, one in one patient, yeah. So, yeah, that's my last slide. Just to thanks everyone in, I mean, the Epistone core that I think uh, we are trying to do a nice job all together, like different, in different fields to go together for some conclusions. Everyone in IRSI guys that are trying to develop all these techniques and helping a lot with that and, and all the organizers. Thank you very much. With the mouse model? Yeah. So in, in that slide, actually, I performed some of the co-culture essays the, the, in the work from, from Joel Blackson. I performed some of the co-culture essays. In this case, for example, we were not able to detect any virus in the co-culture essay. And then we were, able, I mean, after all, when they did all the mice model, they were able to detect some virus in in the in the mice, but all the sensitivity is something that I didn't talk before, and but it's something that is very different from one study to the other because all the sensitivity depends on how many cells you get, and each patient is different, each center is different, and in, sometimes you get a lot of cells and you can get a very good sensitivity. Sometimes you don't get that many cells for any reason and you don't get that much sensitivity. And that's something that we have variable in in all these essays, and and something that we have to do. So you have this quantification that you say five, 500 times more sensitive or so. They didn't tell the experience. Uh, and it's less I think we don't have a still, they don't have the, and uh, we don't have a still all the experience because this is something from last year. And still we need to do a lot of ma much more of these of these cultures to know exactly a number, like how much more it is. I mean, I, I will bet that it's higher. But still, I cannot tell you uh, because they did eight different, and we are starting to do like three. And still, I think it's not enough to do good, a good number. But uh, I still, the culture say we are giving now very good sensitivity because we culture a lot of cells. Um, I would say that this system is working much better because it's like you don't need to activate the the, the, the same mice, the same mouse is really activate in the cells and go further and it's more close to what happened in vivo with the patients when you stop the treatment but I still don't know exactly what's the, the comparison of both the of you So you can put from around 10 million cells to 50, 60 million cells depending if you put CD4 or PBMCs. Like what they did actually, they put PBMCs and then they deplete the PBMCs with a specific antibody for the CD8 because in elite control, the CDAs are really potent inhibiting the, the replication. So you have any CD8, probably you don't get the, the output of the virus. So what they did is they deplete the CD8. We, do a, we just put CD40 cells, straight CD40 cells. We don't have any CD8s in there. And in the experiments that we already did, we put from 10 million to 50 million. No, because those mice are really immunodepressed. There are specific mice that they don't get any yet. Yeah. No, actually they are doing very well and they are very, very well because they are already very immune depressed. They have very huge immunodepression. We do this actually in a specific uh, P3 and with very clean conditions too. But the mice actually are doing very well. Okay. So do you think the difference between the 
the two cell systems is mainly that you can use more cells in this wise model? Or do you think that there's like an added sensitivity of this model if you would use like the same amount of cells? I don't think that is because you can use more cells because they are size, the size that we are doing, the, the big size in here, in the, <coughs> the co-culture essay, we are even putting in, in, in here. We are is even doing like 100 something million of cells in the culture. So we are really using a big amount of cells. I think the, the good thing with the mice model is the activation is higher and it's more, I guess, more natural and more different factors because in this culture we just use PHA, but there are a lot of different factors in the human body or even in, in our small model of the mouse to activate those cells that we cannot control. So I think it's more kind of physiological way to activate the cells. No sé cómo me la han puesto. The last, last speaker uh, will be uh, the, coach, the chair, really the chair of the, of the meeting, <laughs> Javier Martínez Picado, and will address us about the Epistem Consortium. Thank you. So thank you, Carlos, for the introduction. And we are getting to the end. So this is the easiest talk in the, in the, in the afternoon. And uh, it's basically addressed to show you what epistem is and what we want to do and what we do. And I don't have all the data that we could have because we had a meeting uh, this morning where we really put in common a lot of data. But uh, I think I'm going to show you some of the data that we had before this previous meeting. So let me tell you a few things about HIV and HIV cure that came around the, in the earliest talks, but I want to emphasize a little bit. So this data that I'm going to be showing you is data on the United States. So what you see here is the number of people dying of AIDS in the United States, but people living with HIV also in the United States over time. And you see that over the first years of the epidemics, they were growing up in a similar pace. So people infected, people dying. So getting infected was a really bad thing in those days. But after 1995, 96, we had the antiretroviral therapy, the highly active antiretroviral therapy combination. So mainly three different drugs from different drug families. And in, developing, in developed countries, what happened at that point is that we had a, a severe decrease in the number of people dying of HIV, and that people accumulate uh, living with HIV. So first message here, very clear, is that we can treat HIV infection, but we cannot cure HIV infection. Uh, and so I think that until this point, we did quite well treating individuals with HIV infection, but the challenge, the focus of the research challenge after uh, so many years has changed a little bit towards do we have, would we have the ability of cure HIV? That is a very easy question with a really difficult answer. And the reason is that every single patient we stop antiretroviral therapy, viral load rebounds in plasma shortly after stopping therapy. I would, and I would say even too shortly after stopping therapy. So uh, for most of the patients, we're, we're very few people, and actually a here, here in the room has one of the cohorts in Europe of people who's been treated very early after infection, where some of those people, they don't rebound, but this is limited in the number, about 15, 16 individuals that have been identified in his cohort. But for the rest of the people, 99.9% .9 of the individuals with HIV, viral rebound is inevitable. So I want to tell you a few things about why the virus is persistent in, the, in an HIV-infected individual. So actually, the goal of any virus, not only of HIV, is to persist. And what are the molecular and cellular bases of HIV persistence? There are basically three bases. One is a high level of viral replication that induces high genetic diversity and the presence of immune escape. 
both to the immune system and the antiretroviral therapy, and that would induce persistence. The second axis is that this is a virus that gets integrated into the cellular genome. And this is different from other virus. Why can't we cure hepatitis C infection? Because the virus does not integrate. That gets an easier problem. Here, virus integrates, it gets into latency, and if there is any signal that reactivates this latency, there is viral reactivation, and we keep again with persistence. And the third axis is a constant presence of immune inflammation and immune activation. So what can we achieve with antiretroviral therapy? We can achieve two things. We can reduce this axis, and actually we give therapy and despite of some residual level of replication, uh, most of the virus will be inhibited by that therapy, and we can also achieve, not completely, but we can improve inflammation and immune activation. So people on treatment, they will have lower levels of these two parameters. But we can do very little with this axis over here. So treatment will not reduce by, by itself the level and the number of latency or latent virus in the body. So we need to fix this somehow. And there are different strategies out there to try to either find an sterilizing cure or um, what is called a, a lifetime remission for HIV. And these are some of the strategies, and some of them we are following them in, in our institute in Barcelona, how we optimize antiretroviral treatment, and when and how to do that using some molecules that might help to revert latency out of the cells. Therapeutic vaccination has been also used to enhance host control of the infection and immune-based immune therapies. For instance, we are using inhibitors of checkpoints of the immune system. So we can try to reverse pro-latency signaling in these individuals. But I'm going to be talking today about this one. And actually, the reason we are here today is uh, what can we achieve with cell gene therapy, how we can render cells resistant to HIV infection. And again, you saw this uh, today and many days before again. Uh, this is the flim um, patient, uh, Timothy Brown. And the only additional thing that we include here is that obviously uh, he is not an HIV patient anymore, but there are not more patients that have been cured. This is the only one so far. And why this is the only patient? Because um, probably he was transplanted with Delta 32 cells, and that makes a big difference. Um, there are the two cases that uh, Maria showed a while ago, and also uh, me in the, pre in the first talk. These two patients in Boston that got a transplantation with uh, uh, wild-type CCR5 donors, and they took 12 weeks and 32 weeks to, for the uh, virus to rebound. So they are not cured, and we, we don't fully understand what's going on there. So the goal of Epistem is why only one person has been cured of HIV? Can we try to mimic that again? Can we improve that outcome and have more people to be cured of HIV? And what can we learn from that? So let me just move into Epistem, and uh, it's a scientific project to investigate allogeneic stem cell transplantation in HIV-infected individuals. This, is, uh, uh, this uh, uh, project is sponsored by AMFAR. This is the American Foundation for AIDS Research. We are now in the second year of funding. And the, uh, uh, the willingness is to you know, open this as much as possible to different investigators. Because I'm not an hematologist myself, I need, when I start working with that, with, with Jose Luis, and with Gero and others, we, I had to you know, study a little bit on that, and I made a very easy and simple slide for my guidance, and different types of stem cell allogeneic stem cell transplantation. And I learned that you can be uh, a HLA matched sibling donor, or you can be an HLA matched unrelated donor, and these are different situations. As Vanderson said before, you can get a core blood single or double transplantation, and the conditions of APLO compatibility are a little bit more relaxed in that situation. And um, almost finally, you can have an APLO identical family donor, which is not the ideal situation, but it's still possible, and the hematologists are getting a lot of expertise on that. And the fifth situation could be to have an APLO uh, core 
transplantation where you mix part of these core blood cells, either single or double, as Van der Soe said earlier on, and uh, an Apollo identical family donor. So Epistem is studying any of these cases. I want to make that clear. Either being Delta 32 or wild type or heterozygous. So this is a big message for any of you having patients in, this, in, in any of these characteristics. So um, Epistem is, uh, have different partners and their clinical size and experimental sites. So um, we have basically two virology sites, one in Utrecht and one in Barcelona. Uh, we have the um, Vanderson in Oxford who is doing all the core blood coordination and Gero in, in Germany doing the uh, bone marrow coordination as well. And then um, we have um, hematological sites. Uh, there's one in Madrid, uh, one in the Netherlands, and in Germany we also have one. Uh, and these are the uh, partners of Epistem so far. We try to uh, uh, get a, a, a very comprehensive study looking at molecular virology, cellular virology, donor testing, immunology, now we have in Paris uh, Asier working on adaptive immunity, and we also have uh, Julian in Hamburg working on, on immunology as well, and immunophenotyping, and also evaluation uh, uh, document, uh, guidance. The way we are structured is this way. So there is an epistone core partners, as I said, hematologists, virologists, immunologists, and blood bank specialists, but we have also what we call associated teams. So let's say that if you have a patient like Alexandra here, who is there sitting in the room, uh, she will be a clinical associated partner. <coughs> we might have also laboratory associated partners, and uh, Ezekiel is here, who is going to be looking into tracks for thymic output. Uh, so that will be a laboratory associated partners. And then we have a discussion groups. We try to get close to the community groups as well. And, and both and Maria and myself, we deliver talks in different countries for community members. So we really want to know what community members, HIV-infected people or HIV, people who are close to HIV-infected individuals, they feel about that. Uh, um, the other thing that I want to show, and, and this is a slide that Marie and Antoinette uh, show us this, this morning in the meeting we had, are the different sites where patients have been included already in Epistem, and you see people included in Spain, in Italy, in Germany, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, and, uh, and the UK. And there are also now conversations ongoing with Sweden and Serbia. So uh, hopefully we'll increase the number of patients. Uh, when we started, this, this project was started like two years ago now. And uh, honestly, if you ask me, I wouldn't have said at that point that we could uh, have uh, 14 people transplanted and 21 individuals included right now. And the, I think this is a big achievement. I think Anne-Marie and her group had did, done a really well, great work by you know, collecting so many individuals. These 21 uh, uh, centers included, some of them are pending of transplantation, and 14 already transplanted individuals come for el from 11 centers. Uh, Madrid and Barcelona, there are seven uh, patients. And we have five more patients in Spain that are uh, now in line for, for uh, being included in Epistem. In the Netherlands, there are uh, three individuals. In uh, uh, Hamburg, uh, uh, Berlin, Freiburg, there are also a number of uh, patients. In Ghent, there is one. Uh, London, there is one. And now we have one in Canada that is still pending of transplantation. So as you see, the number is increasing. And I think the more patients we deal with, the more information we are going to get. And, and I think this is very interesting. Some people, when I give this talk, some people ask us, well, but what time of malignancies do these patients have? And uh, this is a brief summary of some of the malignancies. As you see, most of them are lymphomas uh, and uh, myeloid leukemia. But then there are other malignancies in a, in a lower frequency. Next slide is probably the most important slide in my talk. And that gives a big overview of where we are. So these are all but one patient. I, I missed one patient in Germany, in Dusseldorf, but these are the 13 patients we have so far. Uh, here you see the uh, uh, post-transplantation time. So you see that one patient, the patient in Italy, he has been transplanted for more than 60 months. So this is over five years now. Uh, so this is a retrospective patient. Um, 
at some patients are more than two years, like uh, these um, two patients in Madrid. Uh, this patient in Madrid as well is beyond the first year of transplantation. So we have uh, things moving on. The second thing in this slide is that when you see an arrow at the end, it means that that patient is still alive, uh, but some patients pass away. And um, mortality rate is about 50% in this context. Uh, the other thing I want to pay your attention on is that um, we are trying to get a lot of different sampling. So we play around with blood and leukoapheresis. Leukoapheresis is the only way to really get deep into sensitivity issues. Unless we really have many cells from periphery, it's very difficult to say whether we are curing or not that patient. We also get bone marrow biopsies, uh, CSF, and ileum biopsies. And in some cases, we're trying to get lymph node biopsies now. Uh, and as you see here, in some cases, we are able to get pre-transplantation samples, and in some cases, we couldn't because the patients were transplanted before epistem was actually created. Uh, the other interesting part of this slide is this table over here, where you can see that if you look in this direction, you'll see how many uh, adult donors we have in the cohort. There are 11 and how many uh, patients have been transplanted with umbilical cord units. It's only uh, three at this point. Uh, and if you look in this way, you'll see that uh, we have five individuals being transplanted with Delta 32 homozygous, and uh, actually uh, eight individuals with wild type, wild type, and there is just one individual that has been transplanted with a heterozygous individual for uh, Delta 32. So I think this is, this is our big numbers right now. Uh, what we've been doing in terms of data. So these are different measurements of the viral reservoir. What you see in the first uh, graph here, and I split that by pre-transplantation and post-transplantation, is what we call a single copy assay. So this is the ultra-sensitive uh, determination for a standard viral load. And what you see here is that uh, this intervention, stem cell transplantation, dropped the number of a single copy assay. Uh, in some cases, below the detection limit. In some cases, still close to the detection limit. You can also look at the number of cells that still harbor a virus, a virus that we don't know whether it is infect infectious or not, but it's a virus. And this is something that's been done in Monique Nihius laboratory. And this is the pre-transplantation determination of total HIV DNA, and these are different uh, uh, time points after transplantation, and you see that there is a significant drop in the number of cells that are infected with the virus. This third slide is the same determination, but done in uh, lymphoid tissue in the gut. We believe the gut is a strong reservoir because lymphoid tissue, especially around the ileum, is very rich in immune, immune tissue. And when we did that in the different patients, we saw also a, a severe decrease in the number of cells that harbor a replication, um, sorry, a, a virus, non-replication competent. And this is a different technique and is put in a different level because this is what um, Maria has shown us earlier before. This is a way to estimate not only the cells that have a virus, but the cells that would have a replication competent virus, a virus that we have the security that can be infectious and is infectious. And this uh, assay is called QBOA for quantitative viral outgrowth assay. And you see that the level of post-transplantation QBOA is lower than the pre-transplantation QBOA. And the final uh, thing that we have been starting doing uh, in the recent uh, uh, months is transferring, as uh, Maria said, transferring CD4 T cells from the transplanted individual into a, a immune suppressed mice and trying to reactivate the virus in these, in these animals. And we believe that if everything, all the techniques I've shown so far and these techniques are all negative, we could have the rational to stop therapy in those individuals. But if any of the previous methodologies would give you a positive data, uh, we might be reluctant to stop therapy. Um, Vanderson gave you some insights before, but I uh, want just to briefly point out that one of the goals of EPISTEM is also to find the best possible donor. And I think that one of the reasons why AMFAR also sponsored this consortium in Europe 
was basically the idea that uh, you know that distribution of delta 32 is not equal in all of the world and the, the more northern Europe you move, the higher the frequency of these individuals. And actually the frequency, for instance, in Spain was below 1%. Uh, Serge is here, who was 0 0.7, 6, 0 0.6. And if you look into North Europe, it's more than 1, it's 1.1 or something like that. So this is interesting and I think that uh, Fanderson and also uh, Sergi and others have done a great effort here. Um, so they've been testing these core bloods in North Europe and also in Spain uh, with the help of Anfer and also the National Transplantation Organization here in Spain. And then Gero and his institution have done a great work to find uh, potential donors uh, uh, from bone marrow. This is very important. So if you have a case of transplantation, feel free to contact Epistem. If we can help with a donor search, we'll be more than happy to do that. And actually, um, Epistem has been producing already some data. And uh, Van der Soor also showed this paper here. Uh, we did in collaboration with Rafael Duarte in Barcelona and published in Lancet HEV. I think that it's fair to acknowledge here that Sergi Carol, who is sitting in the back of the room, was also uh, instrumental in this study. And Maria Salgado from our institution, she did a lot of work, terrific work to put this, this study together. And I think uh, despite the patient died, and I want to put, uh, you, you know, make some details on the, on the presentation that uh, Van der Soor made, is that one of the things that happened in this patient that after he passed away is that we were able to retrieve the cells from the patient and say, can we infect those cells ex vivo with virus, either autologous virus from the patient before the transplantation or laboratory strains of the virus that we know they're very aggressive. So we took the cells out ex vivo and we challenged the cells with the virus and none of the cells from this patient were able to be infected. So we think that in that case, Delta 32 also made the cells resistant to the infection although we cannot assess, we cannot say by any means that the, the patient was cured. So let me conclude by saying that we still uh, need to fully understand how the unique case of HIV cure occurred through this stem cell transplantation. Epistem, and I wanna make this very clear, although some of my colleagues did it before, is an observational study. And the lead is, is taken by the hematologists. And we want to investigate these cases in the, in the context of HIV cure. Epistem works also to generate a registry of Delta 32 uh, uh, potential uh, donors, both from adults and core blood units. And finally, aplocore stem cell transplantation is a feasible hematological intervention that facilitates the availability of donors. We still have some open considerations and these are, some of these questions are discussed within the Epistem partners. And one thing is how different is the aplocore versus the classical allo transplantation. The second is which is the best conditioning in each case. There are many different hematological malignancies and condition is going to be probably different in each case. Condition is of patients with uh, malignancies, is, is it feasible? Gero said, uh, mentioned that before and we know that people from Sangamo is doing this clinical trial on people with uh, uh, lymph ablation. Uh, what is the best antiretroviral treatment on that transplantation context? And, and Marie also made some comments on that. How much immune suppression is needed? And this is gonna be very important for the next step is how much graft versus host is necessary. What is the best treatment interaction strategy in these patients? We are gonna be discussing this in the evening session with, uh, with the Epistem partners. Ethical considerations and the most important thing is how scalable this strategy is gonna be. We know that this is not scalable, but I know in the room there are different people working in gene therapy. Uh, we do believe that gene therapy might be a way to continue, but all the information we can, you know, we can generate in this study can be very important for further studies on gene therapy. Uh, again, as uh, all my friends, I want to acknowledge of the uh, Epistem partners. Uh, you have this website that you can plug in anytime uh, and, and get inform updated information from the Epistem. And obviously, I also want to thank you, many different people that are working in this project. And they are not the people that we are here. 
there are uh, uh, many people in different countries that have been leading with this uh, project. There is the management team, uh, Antoinette, uh, Judith, and Pascual, IRB specialists, and also uh, we have uh, San advisors, Kum van Vincent and Jan van Lunsen, who help us with, uh, with the project. And this is, I think, all of what I wanted to say. If you have any further questions that may help you to understand what Epistem is, I'll be happy to answer it. Thank you. Any question? So, if if there is no if there are no questions, I, I think that we should move forward and have the uh, discussion panel. And I will ask Julian, uh, Asier, and Monique to you know lead the discussion. Yeah, you see it. You'll be more. And also the chairs, I think. And the chairs, I think. Here to help the discussion a little bit, I ask Javier to put up the considerations again, because I assume that some of these points deserve some further explanation or discussion at least. So one of the points I would like to raise is um, maybe a question to Gero, just to start off the discussion. I was intrigued by the comparison that you did between the patient from Berlin and the Essen patient. Um, and I would like to focus a little bit on the effect of the antiretroviral treatment or the absence of antiretroviral treatment. Do you think there's an effect of this first week before transplantation to stop the treatment? And can you elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, um, Do you know, for instance, why they did this? Or? Yeah, I, I don't know why they did this. Um, most of the, the transplant physicians are anxious about the antiretroviral therapy during transplantation settings because of side effects, because of drug drug interactions. So uh, um, many stop the medication, but it's probably not uh, uh, useful, not, not necessary to uh, do so. But in this case, they did it, and uh, some uh, treatment uh, conditioning regimes start uh, up to seven days before the transplant. So, uh, they stop the, the antiviral therapy quite early. And uh, the second point is that the, the patient, the ASN patient, engrafted very late. So there was a long, very long time uh, um, for the virus to relapse. Yeah, I think one other difference was that in the ASN patient, there was some X4 tropic virus present before treatment, mm -hmm. as was not in the Berlin patient. So that would maybe. Not that, yeah. not that clear, like, yeah. like the. Sorry. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. and, and one thing I was wondering. Um, because I'm still, you know, everybody's intrigued by the Berlin patient, I think, and also um, that you stop treatment at the day of transplantation. So just like a wild idea, the fact that you did stop treatment at that day, so the virus could like freely replicate and be recognized maybe later on by the immune system. Do you think that was like part of the solution? It's very unconventional thought, but it's... Yeah, we, we have no evidence for this. We, we make uh, tests for... Uh, HIV-specific T cells before and after transplantation, and they disappeared. And uh, so this would be against your thesis. Yeah. So it's despite the fact that you stopped treatment that we saw cure. Yeah. Maybe as a follow-up question to you, and maybe Javier. Um, so if we go along in future times, could you envision that we, on the one hand, intensify treatment just before the transplantation? or that we try other approaches that we purge 
and then for example use new strategies um, for, for, for the ones that are not in the HIV fields, experimentally um, like highly active uh, antibodies have been developed and would that be an, an interesting additional option to use these antibodies shortly before transplantation? Before and after? That's, that's a good point, but uh, I think that we don't even know whether those strategies might work in regular individuals with no metabolic uh, malignancy. So I, I think that the complexity of living with uh, metabolical malignancies add a layer of complexity uh, to this situation. So it's really difficult to say whether by intensifying treatment or adding more clonal antibodies, which is not going to be different for any other treatment, actually. I mean, to me, my knowledge, using monoclonal antibodies in, 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 in a set of achieved infections like using treatment, they will not make any difference. So I cannot envision a big change by using, for instance, monoclonal antibodies. It means that we have really good drugs, and, uh, and Marie made this summary of integrase inhibitors being probably the best ones in terms of non drug drug interactions. And I actually, we, we switched some of the patients towards that regimen because we thought that it was less, the less toxic treatment. But I uh, don't know whether increasing or intensifying treatment would, would help. I don't think so. I have uh, two questions, one more formal one and one more. The formal one is that we do have a quite good cooperation with people from St. Petersburg. And if you remember this card there, and the, the darkest dot is, is, is this region, so they have a very high number of, of uh, CCR5 beta cell 2 yeah, and they have a lot of patients and, and they are very interested in, in those programs, so I can just invite, I can just invite them to, to join me on the, some restriction or just an, an open consortium where everybody could join. This could be the, the formal question and the more uh, scientific question is, um, there was this at the EBMT, uh, there was a, a presentation on the Synthema trial, and based on their data, they have now, they suggest that there's a, a certain number of, of protected T cells you would need to suppress active infection. And, and I, I'm not a specialist in this, but there, there are some data from population studies how many people should be vaccinated to, to have a to prevent a virus outbreak. Is something like that available for, for a disease like HIV, where you need, let's say, 40% uh, of your T cells protected, and then you won't get an outbreak and have a functional suppression? Or if not, maybe we should use it and try to modulate this in a, in a bioinformatics setting to, to get an idea what kind, what kind of, of T cell protection we need. Because as, as Gero mentioned, never will get to 100 percent protection in a the gene therapy setting or this would be almost impossible. So what, what do we need? So I, I don't think that there is a, a clear answer about that. I know that the people from the uh, Sangamo trial uh, had made some modeling about the number of cells that they will need to modify to, to, to kind of get some um, um, protection. I will say that these models may be true if there is a real selection pressure also from the virus itself, uh, and it's going to uh, eliminate the cells that had not been modified. In, um, my personal opinion is that um, if you have a large fraction of cells that had not been modified, the risk of, uh, of uh, rebound is, is, is really large, and um, we don't have we don't have the real data to, to answer that, but I don't see how, by modifying 10, 20 percent of the cells, we will be free of uh, of of the infection itself, of the risk of uh, of rebound. We could perhaps control that and uh, help um, immune responses to uh, to deal with the virus if uh, we can reduce the dynamic of viral replication. That's for sure. So, but probably we, that will not be a one uh, way approach to, to, to deal with the, with the virus itself. Um. Uh, we are also the first part of the question. Uh, we have contact to St. Petersburg, Dr. Lundsen, uh, was there with us uh, uh, before, 
part of our project and uh, um, yeah, they have uh, indeed um, the situation that they might be, uh, might be easier to find donors. But the, the development in, uh, uh, in Russia is the other way around. The, the number of uh, energetic stem cell transplantation with uh, unrelated donors is, is decreasing because of the crisis. And uh, the haplo identical um, transplantation is getting better and better in the outcome. And they are very close to unrelated uh, stem cell transplantation in the outcome of, of the. Uh, the transplantation. So there's a, a trend in Russia to prefer haploidentical transplantation. So we have no real chance to uh, make the homosexuals for them. Any other questions? I just would like to discuss whether, especially for the hematologist, <coughs> whether you believe that um, the strategy of using uh, donors that are wild type for CCR5 could be a successful, a successful one? Or you really believe that the only way to go is the donor fetish? Raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, yes. Um, and the reason being because the wild type is controlling, it's decreasing. I understand well. So the, the, the our transplant is decreasing the pressure for it, but not eliminating the Well, that depends on, on what you, you term for elimination. Uh, we only, as far as I know, only two patients in Boston, they rebounded. But they rebounded on the basis that they couldn't find anything in their experimental settings. And in that extent, we do have now patients who have been transplanted with wild type donors and we see the same thing so we don't see any virus at all so we we haven't stopped treatment to those individuals but um, but we we need some insights to understand whether these are negative these are negative for the assays we are doing Meaning that we have some level of, you know, we have our limitations, but so far they, they, they are negative. And one of the difference with the uh, patients in Boston mm -hmm. is that patients in Boston, as far as you recall, they were in immune suppression. It's still in immune suppression, but our patients they are not any longer in immune suppression. Mm -hmm. Yes, one of the patients still receiving suppression for if you replace all the cells with healthy cells with no longer before not infected, then you can replace all these cells. In theory, that could be possible. In theory, I mean, it takes years to replace microtia you have after 20 years of time still. So then you can do this as a level body, and then you have a yeah. Always, the new cells can be infected by the things that only very few people have and protected new cells. We are releasing the T cell response. Yeah, if you get the T cells, the question is the new T cells go to the lymph nodes where it's HIV pleasant and they go to each life cell of the genes and then they don't get okay. it. So this is, yeah, it's, you can argue in yeah, yeah, any way. Because if you if we transplant wild type and we maintain the the survival, we are not advancing. Very the same. It's in play that before the transplant, we rely in the antiviral. I think it's my question to be, Sergi, whether if you have a patient who's been transplanted with a wild type CCR5 body, and you do the best you can to find the virus, and you don't find any. Is, do you think this is operational to stop treatment in that individual? Or no? Well, pro providing that the Boston, after resuming the treatment, has responses, maybe. 
I think that the, um, uh, Javier's question resumed to which is the role of CCR5, Delta 32, in, the, in, in improving the chances of uh, obtaining a cure or eradication of or remission in this, in this setting. If it's the only role. If, if it's the only role. But, and I will go beyond the, uh, making the thirst resistant to infection because it was quite intriguing the data that uh, you know, saw about the kidney uh, transplant in uh, Delta 32 uh, patients, and we may wonder also how uh, the CCR5 Delta 32 is affecting trafficking of the cells to the different tissues, and whether this may mm, may be shaping the reservoir also in in, in some way in the in, in the patients. And um, regarding the question about the negative CCR5 Delta uh, oh, people receiving a CCR5 wild type, I will say that. If all the parameters are positive for treatment interruption, obviously I'm one for trying to do a treatment interruptions. And we have already uh, seen, and we have uh, several trials in, in France so in, uh, looking at that, that you can perform treatment interruptions if you uh, follow um, a very structured protocol and uh, taking a lot of precautions. Um, from the clinical point of view, the parameters that may deteriorate when you interrupt the treatment, they can be very quickly restored with prompt uh, antiretroviral uh, resumption. Then there are other, other factors that need to be taken into account, and this also involves social point, uh, points of view uh, about the people that you are actually following up. So there is also the point of view of the clinician is absolutely critical uh, to do that. Knowing the patient is, is the first criteria, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I asked something about the microglia, and you said that a lot of long, we have discussions with fellow biologists and many people, and some people say if you have a regimen um, where a piece of fund is included, it will definitely um, recruit um, and it's, uh, donors and uh, microglia to the brain, and um, you, they're not that long lived. Does anybody have an opinion on that? Yeah, that's, that's an opinion. Definitely no evidence. We would know. Okay, you know, but, uh, I think what me uh, said, probably because we are from the same team. <laughs> <laughs> if we believe that uh, bone marrow transplant, or among any kind of tuberculosis transplant, let's say, uh, is able to replace completely all the hemoprogetic stem cell derived cells, mm -hmm. if that is true, uh, and that is done, then we can eradicate virus health, even in the brain, the microbiome, or in anywhere. Because as you heard, it takes time mm -hmm. to get that complete chimera, complete donor chimera, it takes time. And we don't know how much time we can guess, more or less. Certainly we need to have to shape all the immune system and the immune reactions, the other reactivity has to be in health. In other, or in other words, not infection, not uh, complications of GBHD, etc. But if, if that is okay, then in theory we would be able to completely eradicate the host hemodiasis, which means the HIV hemodiasis, and replace the healthy hemodiasis. Mm -hmm. Do you have any infection to that type of cell, new cells, which can be infected? Yes, of course. All that, all that time you need to be able to all the time. All the time. All the time. All the time. No, no, no way around to, uh, to hold the, the drug, I think. Yes, and, and regarding the interruption of the therapy, the retroviral therapy, the key point here 
probably is the sensitivity of the tests to, to measure uh, all the compartments and to be sure uh, as much as we can that the patient is met. And if we are able to improve on that compared to uh, the experience in uh, the hospital patients and, and so on, uh, I think it's nowadays is the only way to really uh, know what happens with the reservoir in, in this setting, stopping the, the under reservoir. Mm -hmm. I think even the, all these patients that are Delta A2 all type, I think they are giving us a lot of information because they are having different outcomes. Some of them are, they don't, we don't see virus, some of them we see virus, and there are a lot of difference in the, all the bacteriological process. And what we know already is very good to get to patients exactly the same. So because here we are increasing the number of patients that we're having, we are seeing difference in the different patients. So for example, crap versus cause disease is important. So how long it takes to get the, the full chimera is important, this? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, a lot of questions that you already kind of manage and we need to put together with the HIV research and HIV eradication need. All the things that you already know that is important no? for for the pathological disease is important no? for the HIV disease. Let me tell you what you see uh, in this business, like the system and HIV, uh, that wants us as hematologists things that we never thought before. Uh, who, for a hematologist, who cares about replacing the whole of disease of the host? So we want to get cure the leukemia. We don't care about to replace the whole <laughs> so we never thought of uh, you can ask us how many of your transplants for those that have yet put on the skin, how many of those transplants are able to replace the whole the, the post I don't know. I know most of our transplants for them is a mixed camera. If we look at very ultra sensitive, very ultra sensitive, Probably in the answer, most of them are mixed chimeras and not complete donor chimeras, mm -hmm. which is complete donor chimera is the eradication of mm -hmm. the post chemopolysis. Mm -hmm. We don't need to reach that point to cure leukemia, to cure many of the leukemias. There are many leukemias that relapse, and it's because we don't get that full donor chimera. Mm -hmm. But all these questions are in, uh, something that are not important to the hematologists because we are not trying to replace completely that. Mm -hmm. Now with the HIV business, we have to get to the point of getting a full dollar camera by the most sensitive method, the uh, style method mm -hmm. that we can use, in order to eradicate the HIV as well. Mm -hmm. as, far as, as, far, as far as the HIV reservoir is only in the hemopoietic survival cells, if you tell me that the HIV can infect or can be in the other cell that does not arrive in the hemopoietic stem cell, then we are out of the game. <laughs> yes, it, I, 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 I think these are very wise comments, and I, I, I think in general we are, we are only in the, at the beginning, even for transplantation, because uh, if you look at the immune reaction against other viruses, we need to learn much more. But, um, Gero, since we only have this one example, I think it is probably very important to look behind the CCR, uh, the, uh, five, uh, the Delta mutation. And um, I, I mean, this um, patient has been extensively studied. So, if we have the hypothesis that the immune system plays a role, do you do you have any any idea whether it's maybe the HLA of the host, maybe uh, of of the recipient, maybe the mixture? Is it Kia haplotypes? Um, is there something we are missing on all the other cases? Um, all of these additional things have been tested in the Carol's case and. There was no, no trace, no, no good idea what could, could you contribute to the, the, result, uh, to the result. And uh, of course, we have no um, um, real idea what, uh, what this host disease makes in, this, uh, uh, in the setting. But well, this host disease is always present in the gene transplantation. It's also present in, in patients who receive a wild type. 
uh, um, transplant. And the chemotherapy, the conditional regime is also present in autologous transplantation. And we don't see any real impact on the reservoir of autologous transplantation. And um, I think, uh, noted that um, probably uh, quite alone with my opinion, <laughs> but I think it's only the CCR5 greater 32 deletion. And uh, um, for example, uh, remember the, the experiments from Paul of Cannon. Uh, the animal model of the seam finger, we get the, the mouse, uh, seam finger manipulated CCR5 treated cells, make the infection, and the infection goes to zero after a part of time. There was no chemotherapy, there was no conditioning, there was no growth drug in this host. So if you have an HIV patient and you make a slip of your finger and he isn't after that CCR5 level 32 homocycles, I believe that the virus is a <laughs> <laughs> Two, that it was positive later on. Um, so it's not just delta 32. I mean, we have the SS patient that the virus came up yeah, and, and, sure. it was, and it was to the store, and it was not just. Escape is always possible, but I think that uh, that eradication is uh, is uh, limited to the CCR5 delta 32. I think that there are, there are different ways to look at uh, I agree with you. I think that the Delta uh, 32 in, in, in Timothy Brown was absolutely uh, major, uh, uh, perhaps the most important issue. Uh, um, however, when we look at the other uh, people who have been receiving this, uh, this kind of uh, transplant, we see a decrease in the, in the HIV DNA, at least the, the, the parameter that we can look at more, more easily. So there is something that is decreasing the reservoir, and we should look at that as an opportunity, perhaps to, um, even if we cannot eradicate, to kind of uh, achieve um, HIV remission, that is a, a little bit different of, uh, of the malignancy remission. But I think that this is something that is an opportunity. Uh, the difficulty is, like uh, we were discussing, uh, the complexity is, is huge. I mean. Um, my interest in, in the HIV field has been for many years to, stu uh, to study extreme cases. And here I'm kind of having the impression that we are looking at extreme cases within the extreme cases. <laughs> and uh, looking at, from an HIV field and looking at any of these patients, I, I see like 10 different micro clinical trials in one single patient uh, going on at the same time. And we are just looking at, at the uh, period of the transplant that was going on during the transplant intervention, but there is also a history for this patient in the past. And as just, just an example, um, I'm working now with uh, um, uh, hematologists in, in, uh, in Paris uh, that um, are uh, looking at patients that have uh, chronic myeloid uh, leukemia. And we are testing uh, molecules that are used in the, in the regular treatment of these patients uh, on cells from HIV infected patients and the results are, are absolutely incredible because many of the mechanisms that are um, being targeted by these molecules are the same that are having an impact in the persistence of the reservoir. So we also need to take into consideration all the past that these patients uh, have before arriving uh, there and I think that this is, is complex but it's worth it to have this, uh, actually the idea of this consortium was I guess to, to try to put them some, uh, together all these observations and try to uh, find common paths that could help us in, in, in getting the, the best uh, outcome uh, from, from this approach. Okay. That was a nice uh, concluding remark. <laughs> 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 I, I give another example. Um, there, there are reports of, of patients, uh, of not patients, uh, there are people who have this natural, uh, natural resistance, uh, they are CCR5, they have 32 homozygous, receive uh, contaminated blood transfusion. So uh, they were exposed against HIV, billions of copies went into the, the uh, people and they won't get infected. And what is the difference between them and Timothy Brown? He has also billions of copies before the transplantation, but after the transplantation, there was no corresponding uh, path for HIV, and so the tons uh, grew up, and even if, uh, this condition where uh, the virus is mutated, this is uh, 
of course, a possibility, but if uh, uh, it stays on the CCR5 receptor in 5 to 40 hours, uh, I think this is a reason why it doesn't take it back. <laughs> well, I, I think the CCR5 story is absolutely fantastic. It's a, it's a very important protective measure. It's certainly, it's certainly essential. Uh, but it's not the only one. So, uh, that I agree. It's, it's a central but it's not the only one. That's what probably we are seeing. Uh, for example, the, the, the drugs have to be given the heart, the, the car, to avoid what happened to Corvella's patient, for example, that, that that's an cohort. I don't know who, who represented the, the mixture, I think, anyway, the, the mixture of virus of tropics. If there are a few exports, you, know, you need to be the heart, for sure. It's only why the CCR5 is not protecting you. So all those factors are, are playing mm -hmm. a certain role in the different cases that have been reported. Each patient is a story. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that, like the time to abruptment. I don't know if Berlin patient maybe it was maybe instead of few days or I don't know exactly the time it is. If it take maybe two months or three months, I don't know how it will be. So there are other small factors yeah. around it. It's a personal time. No, I mean, patient side is a great, great patient. I'm going to show you as yesterday says in the meeting, and you're going to, to demonstrate that the dog stops. You only need one dog talking to you. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's what we call with the very patient. Was a miracle, was a chance, was by luck, or was just perfect, whatever it was. But mm -hmm. it did show us that that is a possibility. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. we care. We are all behind. All behind. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to reproduce. So. And this because, and probably it's because it's not. It's not the only factor. What uh, mm -hmm. you said before, I, I also am convinced there are other factors, but that, for sure that one, the CCR5 is central. That is mm -hmm. a big factor. Mm -hmm. yes. It was a sign from above. Mm -hmm. It was the heavy start of the other patients. <laughs> <laughs> and for the first time, I think uh, no one had done a second or third trial. Of course, okay. because the, the, the dog shouldn't talk. Yeah. If you need one dog talking, mm -hmm. and then you, you go with that. Maybe a question to the hematologist. Uh, uh, so if you have uh, the donor, would there be any specific, um, if, if you, for example, for instance, somebody who's heterozygous, could you imagine something that you um, uh, use the, 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 the stem cells of the, uh, the donor again and uh, um, mo mo modify, modify the cells and infuse them? They did in the donor cells that's what yeah. they are trying to do, Tebas is trying to do um, and to transfer and translate that to the healthy donor. Sure. Mm -hmm. That would be something. Yeah. But he's doing it with the autologist. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's an autologist. You can look for it or side boost donor. Yeah. Yeah. But you already have a fifty percent mm. dose shut down. Mm -hmm and then try to convert to edit. Second well, the question would be yeah. if you could do it after the transplantation in a, a second approach. Because you, you have the donor and then you, um, for example, you would vaccinate the donor and do another transplantation or you would use the stem cells, modify them and reinfuse them into the transplanted HIV patient. Mm -hmm. But why should say after the Conditions the patient again. And well, could you, could you do it maybe two weeks after? Or, or, I, I. Two weeks after, this patient, you, you have to bear that in mind too. I think it will be showing. Show. These this transplants are difficult. These are not easy yeah. transplants. And these are very sick patients for a long time. Plenty of complications, uh, immune suppression, the interaction with the drugs. Microcytes. They are very sick people. They get infected again and again. Then they get the GBHC and probably, probably is related with the chronic inflammation that these patients have. And so they, they, we have to assume that most of them are going to develop GBHC acute or chronic or accepting GBHC. So all that period of time, which may last months or years, I don't think you can do much about it. You just have to be combination and require therapy and try to survive. Yeah, uh, sure. To get away of the to get far from the transplantation. Yeah. 
Then afterwards, when things settle, then you may start to think about curing second cure. You cure already the leukemia, okay? Now cure the HIV. Uh, and and that, that's what you are talking about. But what you get with the CCR5, you get the whole thing in one shot. That's what, that's what uh, Gero used to tell. Uh, and, and, and furthermore, they, they, they stop the, the heart with the zero, which is something unbelievable. Who was the responsible for all the list of the authors? Who was the responsible for stopping the, <laughs> the guy on the zero? That, that's because he did, he did the choice, but he did very well. Just, uh, we wouldn't do that now, for sure, but he did it. <coughs> so now we have the demonstration. <laughs> Because <laughs> the Jehovah's patients have had a yeah, first group of disease before. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. all the gentlemen have been on the phone. One of the patients was still on a immunosuppressive therapy when they stopped the, or, or very close to the suspension. Mm -hmm. And they um, have uh, Kimmerin's studies. Yes. Yes. Uh, they, uh, how was uh, was Complete done. Complete done. Complete done. They used a very old Method. Yeah. Here we have one this last question because we are run out of time. Go ahead. Yes, no, a suggestion. I mean, if I know a therapy apart from the election in season five, uh, I know it's in the progenic therapies, there's uh, one methodology that can be used. They use uh, to insert TCRs against antigens of cancer and to infuse them to control the cancer. Could we do this with the donor? Sure. With the donor. With the donor. So if you refuse the stem cells, refuse, and also these cells transfer the TCR against the virus as a traditional tool to eradicate the virus. It's a, the problem is the it's, it's reprogramming the cell in a certain TCR. The problem is to have yeah the, the CAR technology has one limitation which is the antigen and HIV has a great variability. So the likelihood of of cars to respond effectively against the virus is limited to a very concerned capital that should be there all the time. If the virus breaks through into variability, it's very hard. I mean, CARS has been designed for HIV before, yeah. and mm -hmm. the uh, success has not been very good because of that. And in cancer, they still have that limitation, the specific the specificity of antigen. Mm -hmm. and that is uh, but If you analyze the virus before, Finally, which sector can try? I mean, this is only idea. But, this is, that, but that might work only if you have very monophyletic virus. The, if it has a virus that diversifies in yeah. that version, it's maybe very good. The, there are a couple of uh, assays going on in, in non human primates uh, with HIV and actually mimicking um, either using public clonotypes that are shared by many. Uh, uh, subjects and targeting conserved regions of the virus, but it's quite unknown what uh, may happen uh, because, as uh, Javier said, the, the variability of the virus is too high, and it's, it's likely the, that even if it worked for a, a short period of time, the virus is going to, to escape. There are uh, other um, approaches uh, that are being uh, uh, pursued in the non human primates, so this is deriving cells from. What uh, we have discussed uh, before, the, from elite controllers or natural controllers, um, that uh, seems to be able to adapt many variables in the in the in the molecule, but this will be um, limited to patients matching for for this uh, HLA. But this is something that is actually being tested, mm -hmm. taking cells or taking uh, TCRs specifically from people who are able to control and trying to. Uh, to, to transfer it to, to other uh, patients. But this will be limited in any case. Okay. So I think we're going to be closing the uh, session. Uh, before we go, let me tell you a few things. First is that 
on behalf of Anne Marie and myself, let you know that the epistem is open for any collaboration in Europe or outside Europe. So if you have any case, please contact uh, epistem and we'll try to facilitate as much as we can everything. Second thing is to thank you for coming to the workshop. I know some people had to leave already, but thank you for staying. Thank you to the speakers and moderators. I want to thank also uh, Albert Pudrak, who has been in charge of the logistics for the meeting. Uh, he had to leave, but uh, thank you to him. And also Gile, I mean, the sponsorship of this small workshop has been done thanks to Gile. So Gile, Spain, Hematology and ID. So thank you them. We, we could have this. And then I know that we are not able yet to cure HIV, but for girls, please. <laughs> <laughs> so for the rest of the mortals, we'll have uh, a cup of champagne downstairs in the same place where we had lunch. Gary, no, he will have one. <laughs> Thank you.